What's in your glass? Chances are it's a uh, malt whiskey, right? Barley and water, nothing else. And yet, with yeast and maturation in an oak cast, cask, there's just endless flavour. It almost seems infinite, the amount of flavours and aromas that you get out of the glass. But what if we switch that up? What if we change the grain? What if we mess around with the process a wee bit? And what if we change the way we're maturing it? Does it improve things? Or does it just make it a wee bit different? I'll see you in a minute. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Thursday night. Welcome back to the V-Pub. Apologies for taking an Easter break last week and having a wee bit of rest, a wee bit of a week off. I know it was only one week, but it means that I've not seen you in two weeks. And I did miss you. I didn't know what to do with myself last Thursday night, but I was busy organising and getting things done behind the bar at the V-Pub. I hope you're all doing very, very well, and I hope you're looking out um, or looking forward eh, to a wee bit relaxed whiskey time with all of us tonight. Bit of a strange topic, talking about strange whiskies, I know. But I've collected enough of these whiskies over time and enough of these samples and things and suggestions from the community that rather than do them kind of one dram at a time, I thought that I'd bring them together and kind of explore them, not just for the sake of here's an odd whiskey, let's compare it to something else, but actually talk about how our traditional whiskey has come to be and what ha what can be done within the regulations and the definitions that are set out for what we know Scotch whisky to be. And then if we move around or we're unshackled or we're uh, not um, tied down by, let's say, the claustrophobia of that, what can be achieved? And is it worthwhile? And also the big question, I suppose, for you, all of you, is it worthwhile you actually get out and spend in your money? on those kind of experimental and oddball whiskies. Well, we've got a really quite remarkable selection to share with you tonight. Lots of fun to be had here, lots of comparisons to, to be done. And of course, I've brought in some support in the shape of a, the ever popular and much requested Roddy Graham, who's waiting in the background, that is going to come in in a wee while and join me. In the meantime, I'm going to jump into the chat and welcome all you dedicated barflies and beautiful whiskey folk. Cheers and welcome everybody. I hope you're all doing very, very well. Well, well over 200 of you in before things are even kicked off. It's fantastic to have the support. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much for your up thumbs and likes as well. David Owen is here, Steve A, and to support me and as, an, and as an admin. Fantastic, Steve. Always wonderful to see you. Curtis Campbell saying hello, everybody. Welcome, Curtis. Nick Massey, uh, Whiskey 101. Marcus Kreitner, good to see you, Marcus. Uh, Jimmy Legg, Bruno Martins, Tom Scaramuzza, and uh, Birthday Boy. Let's pause for a second. Uh, welcome, Bruno, Jimmy. Good, great to see you all. Uh, welcome, uh, Tom. But I want to make a, take a, just a moment eh, to celebrate. Uh, there's a couple of birthdays tonight, actually. Um, but this one, now that I've seen that he's in tonight on his birthday, and I guess that's a symptom of lockdown and it's an unfortunate. Um, but there's a gentleman in whose eh, birthday it is today, and he started celebrating quite early. We've got a wee photo to share with you um, that was shared in a, in a chat group earlier today, and I'll share it. It's a fantastic picture. But I'd like everybody to raise a wee glass and uh, wish a happy birthday to who must be one of my longest supporting barflies. He's a gentleman I've had the fun of his company uh, on two or three separate occasions and I've always had great, great times with him as well. Of course, I'm talking about my friend Rolf. I'm talking about Ebhead. It's his birthday today. So barflies, please raise a glass to this handsome and dashing gentleman. I know he's nervous about the photo I'm about to share, but don't worry, Rolf. Um, what side do I need to move to? This side. This is Ebhead. This is the face you don't normally get to see, but look at him. Such a happy, fantastic guy to hang around with, enjoy a whiskey with. This is Rolf. You know him as Ebhead from Norway. Rolf, many happy returns, my friend. It's wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to have your support, and it's wonderful 
to be able to call your friend and raise a glass on your birthday. Many happy returns, Rolf. Cheers to you, my friend. Happy birthday. I'm enjoying a wee 21 year old, Glenn Burgey. Just to make sure my palate is okay tonight, uh, this is a Black Friday uh, whiskey exchange expression. I think from 2019, maybe. I think it was two years ago. Um, I got my vaccination this week, early this week, and it kind of knocked me for six a little bit. Honestly, I didn't react too well to it. Knocked my palate off a wee bit too. But I seem to be okay tonight. Not 100%, but well above 90, let's say. Anyway, buddy, I hope you're having a great birthday, and uh, I am looking forward to being able to get together when all this is blown over and raise a glass once more. While we're on the subject of birthdays, we have a special birthday too. Um, a, a, a more local girl, uh, she's on the east coast of Scotland, and uh, this week, tomorrow, actually the day after tomorrow, she's enjoying um, her last few hours, I guess, of her 30s. She turns 40 in two days' time. I hope she's in here tonight. Uh, her and her other half, Grant, are often hanging out in here, but I'd like you also to raise a glass for our barfly, Vicky Thompson, and wish her a very, very special and happy 40th birthday in two days' time. Vicky, it's been fantastic to have you support me for so long. Uh, I know that we've met, I know we got to hang out that night in the pot still, and I'm looking forward to the next time, Vicky. In the meantime, I hope you have a cracking, unfortunately for you, a lockdown 40th, but things are getting a wee bit better. Vicky, many happy returns. Wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to be able to say happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Vicky Thompson. Cheers. Good stuff to be able to celebrate together. Yeah, missing lots of orange. Uh, and I'll, uh, anybody that's trying to get hold of me, just type Aquavita or at Aquavita, and I see it is orange, and I try and pick it up. But Eric, my friend in Canada, has bought me a drama. Say, my goodness, it's good to be back. He's usually teaching yoga on a Thursday night, Eric. It is. It's good to have you back, buddy. Thursday nights again with Euro and the barflies take the sting out of another lockdown. Ah, okay. So you're back in lockdown in Canada, nightmare. Slant you to the pub family and happy birthday to Rolf. Thank you so, so much, my friend. I'm actually out of my, I've got a wee sip left here. Um, and I don't want to drink too much. I'm not sure how I'm going to be after my vaccination. Um, I'm just going to be careful tonight. But uh, I'll be very, very grateful to have this wee last sip and say thank you, Eric. Nice to welcome you back and thank you for your dram. Cheers. Let's catch some of you guys in the lounge before I jump in and, and uh, cover a wee intro to the topic tonight. Feeling a wee bit rusty. Feels like longer than two weeks ago I last did this. But that's okay. Ryan Sutherland is here saying, hi, evening. Hey, Roy, good to see you, Ryan. McCallum Fenner, the doc is in. Uh, uh, oddball whiskey equals burp on. I'm not so sure. That might happen anyway. And Scotty S is in. Scotty, great to see you, Scotty, up and uh, just living a wee bit north of me saying, uh, good uh, evening from Maputo. Is that where you are? So you're not in Scotland right now, Maputo. I don't even know where that is, Scotty. But it's wonderful that you're able to tune in and hang out with us. My, my friend Aaron McFault is here. Chris is here. Peter Box. Hexie, 771 Aquaviti. Hi, Roy. Mark from Australia. Friday morning here. So no drama in hand. Thank you so much for tuning in, despite it being early hours down there in Australia. Nice to have you in, Hexie. You're very welcome here. Gavin is here. Uh, saying, Roy, good evening. Good to have you in, Gavin. That's Gavin Brownlee in the East Coast. Donald Rance, fantastic in Canada. Aquavita, I'll pour some Tailing 14 chestnut cask finish. Maybe be very similar to one of the ones that we might have tonight. And then some Method Madness Wild Cherrywood pot still soon. Oddball finishes for a fantastic topic. Well, I hope it's going to be an interesting topic, honestly, Donald, but thank you very, very much. Mark Slinger is here, Neil Laverty. Uh, actually, Jetley in France. Wheels is in. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, buddy. I know that we got to hang out in Texas. Uh, I'm missing that too. I'm missing that uh, fantastic annual fix of community. It looks like we... Uh, I don't know, maybe it could happen this year. I know the date has been penciled in. Maybe you're going to be there in Texas again. Good to welcome you into the VPUB, my friend. Benny Fries is in saying good evening to all whiskey folk out there. Good good to have you, Benny. Always great, great to see you in as Gerben Blocker. Sheila, Whiskey Central is here as well. Fantastic, Sheila. Just sent you a wee email before we went live tonight. Uh, Stefan Novak is in. Fantastic, Stefan. More than one of the samples that I am sharing tonight have come from you. Um, 
Uh, so many of the nice whiskies I've had have come from you, Stefan, honestly speaking. Uh, you're a gentleman, and uh, it struck me just how many of the samples that I could have picked for tonight have come over from Germany from Stefan. Fantastic to have you in, my friend. Cheers. Rob at Whiskey in the Six is in saying, hello, everybody. Fantastic to have you in, Rob. I hope you're doing very, very well over there in Canada, my friend. Uh, Rob, obviously, from Whiskey in the Six, he's been doing his content for over five years now in YouTube, and it's brilliant to have him in here hanging out with us. A couple of drams bought for me. I don't want to miss these. My goodness, so many uh, folk in chatting already. Um, let me see. Wow, I have missed it. Where's it gone? Uh, Stephen Toth has uh, joined the Aquavitae Barflies. Thank you very much for your support. Stephen, that's you got access to all these fun uh, emojis and things. Vicky Thompson's in. She says, I'm blushing. Looking forward to Isla on the 8th of May. Oh, superb, Vicky. It looks like you're going to be able to travel by the 8th of May as well. I hope things are opening up. I hope you get to enjoy Isla to its fullest. Can't think of a better way to enjoy my 40th birthday, honestly, Vicky. Just a couple of weeks to go. Well done. Luna Aaron's saying, oh my, wishing a happy early birthday. Isn't that unlucky? Um, not unless you're superstitious, eh, and I'm not. Um, but also Grant requested that I put the happy birthday out to Vicky as well. So I guess that it's if it's requested, surely that uh, neutralises any potential uh, misfortune. Yeah, I've definitely missed, uh, I, can, I can't find, a super, I've found it now. Oh my goodness, it's going to be so tough to pronounce. It's Patrick Zelensky. Let me let me go with that. Patrick, I hope I've pronounced that well. You're obviously out there in Norway. He's saying, hello, everybody. Been watching on replay for a couple of months and finally made it to the live stream. Cheers, guys. Feels like home already. We just want you to feel comfortable and welcome, Patrick. But thank you very, very much for your drama, friend. Nice to have you in. Cheers. And I uh, uh, welcome Stephen to the Barflies group. Thank you very much for your support. Cheers. Mm. And also Patrick has joined Barflies as well. So I've just taken my first sip of our oddball whiskey tonight. So I encourage Roddy in the background to start exploring this first one. Very light and sweet. Not overly challenging, not overly oily or bold. Quite delicate even, 43% ABV. I've put this at the start of the lineup tonight on purpose because I wanted just a kind of general... Um, just easing into this kind of strange world of things that are clearly not even close to being scotch in almost every case. There is one scotch whiskey in here tonight that's in here just out of, uh, um, let's say a point of curiosity, that's the most polite way I can put it, um, but the rest of it is really quite out there, some more than others. But this one is from the only uh, distillery, the only whiskey distillery in Mexico uh, using their traditional native grain. Uh, Vlad is in Whiskey Malt Content has bought me a dram to say another great evening with you in the bar flies. Roy, cheers to you with the Laphroaig 10 sherry in my glass, Vlad. Now, that's the brand new Laphroaig that was out. It's certainly brand new in the UK. I don't know if it's been released anywhere else first, but it's only just recently out. Quite interesting from Laphroaig, 48% ABV, 10-year-old H statement on there, sherry cask finish. Um, it's a wee bit pricey. It's north of £60 in the UK. Um, but if it's good, you know, I'd like to see... Lefroy moved more in that direction. I feel like their 10 year old is, I mean, it's still celebrated. People still love it. I find it a wee bit difficult to know, uh, right now. And I much more, uh, I prefer some of the other releases from Lefroy, none more so than the, their annual release of the Cast Strength, which is fantastic usually. And Royale 431 is in fantastic. A rare, find, a rare Friday off for me tomorrow means I can pop my head around the door for once. Looking forward to Roddy's hat collection. Now, I was able to match the name Royale 431 up just this week, and I've already forgotten. Maybe it'll come to me a wee bit later in the stream. But it's really wonderful to have you in, and thank you very much for your virtual drama, friend, and I'm glad that you're looking forward to Roddy, although I do believe he's in a hat-free mode tonight. I think his hats are for Roddy's being our tour guide. Cheers, my friend. Thanks to you. Royale 431. Age is not kind, is it, when it comes to memory? So oddball whiskies. I think there's an argument that the Scotch whisky industry, as an example, could be a wee bit more innovative. And I've heard that 
repeated over and over throughout the years. And when things kind of are caught or found to step outside the norm, they're quickly snapped back again and kept very on track and nice and neat and tidy and well within the definitions by the SWA. We know that that happens. And sometimes we can hear that being complained about a wee bit. But then we look at the alternatives. And we look to see, well, well, if the shackles were taken off, what could actually happen? You know, what could be done? What if malt whiskey didn't need to be made from only barley? What if it didn't need to be only made in pot stills? What if it didn't need to have all these other definitions such as oak and three years and all these other things? What else could be done? So I guess when you are from another country or when you're not making whiskey and going to be labelling it as whiskey, or certainly not Scotch whiskey, you have the freedom to do lots of bizarre and different things. Sometimes you can even work within the definitions and still occasionally come up with something that's a wee bit creative, a wee bit odd, a wee bit different. Mm. We're not going to be sipping this tonight, but just as an example, here's a bottle from, uh, this is made at Tomatin Distillery, but this is not Tomatin. Um, the, the label here is very, very small. It's very difficult for you to see. Printed up here, the name, it's not going to be easy to see if I can get it to focus, maybe. Kubokan. It's not Tomatin. It's a completely different spirit made in a different way. Um, peated differently, processed differently. Um, it's, but it's made at Tomatin Distillery. Kubokan is peated spirit from the Highlands. This particular expression, by the way, the standard signature is already a very good peated Highland whiskey. But this one, presented at 46% ABV, um, is one of their creation series. Uh, they do a, a Black Isle uh, matured one. That's, I think it's is it a Moscatel wine, maybe, and Black Isle casks it goes into? This one is the one that I was intrigued with most. I felt it was interesting. That's why I bought this whiskey. I thought it was an interesting whiskey. This is matured in, or let's say finished in, um, Japanese shochu casks. And I think some virgin oak as well, Euro actually European virgin oak, which is different. Not American virgin oak, European uh, virgin oak. I found this to be quite an interesting whiskey and a curious thing. Um, it's not opened, it's still sealed. Um, but honestly, the, the whiskies that we're exploring tonight, beyond our first dram tonight, things are going to get way, way wilder than this. This is still operating within the remit of Scotch whiskey. Shochu casks, um, European virgin oak, American virgin oak, Moscatel, ale casks, all of that as well within the definitions and can be used. So this is relatively safe if a bit curious for a Scotch whiskey. But we're not going there tonight. We're going outside of those boundaries. I think there's an argument that for any producer to ask you to spend money on the whiskies that we're going to be trying tonight, you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to be something that's of interest to most people. Most of these are a curio, I think, to me, from my perspective as a Scotch drinker. But somebody has to try them. The Stefan Novaks of this world, the community. Somebody out there is going to be curious or brave and step forward and buy these. So maybe there has to be a hub. Maybe there has to be people out there sharing these things and talking about them in order to try and encourage you to explore and try or to reassure you that the definitions and regulations, whether it's bourbon you follow or scotch or whatever it may be, are there for a reason. <laughs> And they have evolved because they produce a very good thing. And your money is probably be better spent kind of staying there in the safe place. So maybe it's up for, you know, the action of one to benefit the many, whether it's someone in the community, someone who's a, a, a commenter, a blogger, a vlogger, a channel, whatever it may be, to kind of take a hit, take one for the team and to step out into some of these crazy places and try them and make comment on them and to kind of try and work out what they think of them before you go um, spending your money on the more oddball things that are out there. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight, more or less. Trying to have a bit of fun with it as well. We could have anything up to about eight whiskies, but we're going to try and keep it to six, seven at the most, I think. Um, there's plenty to be getting on with. We've kind of looked at grain. We've kind of looked at process. We've kind of looked at maturation, all of it. 
we're not staying inside Scotland or even even Europe. We're, we're going uh, far outside those boundaries as well in order to explore what is out there within the kind of rough uh, bubble, the rough kind of whiskey verse, let's say. Anyway, I'm calling in support tonight so that you're not just getting one man's opinion, you're getting somebody that's kind of got a seasoned, kind of open-minded attitude, uh, but a, a, a real uh, experience and grounding and enjoying whiskey. He's the same as me. He's mostly comfortable in, inside the world of scotch and other honestly good quality spirits and booze. He's into cider, he's into beer, he's into uh, wines and champagne and other things too. Uh, and he works at uh, 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 and off sales in the UK, a spirit specialist in the UK. You've had, you've seen him before, Roddy Graham. He's been on a few times, but he's open-minded, and what he likes to explore is often things that are interesting. Well, I think Roddy Graham, if you're good to come in and join me now, I think what we have for us to uh, enjoy together tonight uh, could be interesting. Roddy, how are you, my friend? I'm good, thanks, Roy. Yes, um, thanks very much for um, inviting me on and for this crazy selection of samples that you've that you've. Uh, it's not blind tonight. Us. Normally, oh, I bring you on, and it's blind. I'm hitting you with blind things, blind all the time. We, we exchange blind samples, but I'm bringing you everything so you know what you're getting into. You know, I feel like I have a responsibility to tell you what these things are before you go sipping them and. That's just the way we're going to play it tonight. But I have to, at the head of the show, make a confession. It's wonderful to have you on, and I would be inviting you on regularly anyway, my friend. But I don't think the barflies would forgive me <laughs> if I stopped inviting you on. Out of all the folk that I have on, I think you've become almost a kind of semi-regular. And if I let it go too far before you're on again... I start to get the wee reminders popping up saying, when's that Roddy guy coming on again? <laughs> he was quite interesting. So thanks very much for joining me. I'm just going to say quickly to Donald Ranson Canada, uh, saying if anyone wants to experience fantastic oddball finishes uh, or whiskey, uh, look to Ireland, Chestnut, Acacia, Cherry. Now Middleton's Method and Madness just released a Mulberry finish. Wonderful stuff, Donald. You might see a wee appearance from that very thing a wee bit later. Uh, thanks, Donald. Thank you very much for your virtual drama friend. Cheers. Mm. So, Roddy, I'm very, very grateful to you joining me tonight, even when it's crazy uh, experimental stuff. Your your uh, video is glitching a wee bit, it's freezing a wee bit, but I know that we've tested your audio and it's rock solid, so right. okay. as long as the folk can hear you, we're in good shape. Okay, okay. Um, you can hear me nice and clearly, right? Yeah, uh, everything's running fine here. Um, I guess it's uh, just the, the Wi-Fi has been a bit picky tonight. Um, I, need, I, I need to do what you do, Roy, and get a run a Ethernet cable all the way from the router. But um, then, well, then have a... in this new room, I'm at the furthest point away from the router. Aye. And I, I have a 20-meter cable running through the house every Thursday evening <laughs> because the Wi-Fi is likely to, to, to let me down. Um, but I... It's fine, it gets packed away afterwards. Maybe you need to try that next time. But we can see you and we can hear you, and that's all we need, buddy. Mm -hmm. Did you have a chance to to get your uh, nose and palate around this first wee dram? I, I did, yes. Um, I was kind of doing the th you know, that thing that you do where you run your nose along everything uh, just yes. to... to get a sort of... Because, you know, when you get a quick impression of something, that sometimes it's more accurate than if you're... <laughs> is that number two that you're yes it was number two right number, on the back of number one <laughs> yeah no, number number two is uh, possibly the weirdest of the bunch um it could be the i can see some i can see some good weirdness in it so but um this this first one as you said right it's a it's a it's a super easy introduction to um outside of the norm the, right yeah, the, the, to the topic. Uh, I mean, it's. I think if you if you'd given that to me blind, you know, I would have been. Uh, I wouldn't have. You uh, it, it would have taken me quite a while to to leave Scotland. You know, it's it smells. You know, it's, I, to me, it smells like a Scotch grain whiskey. You know, I was going to say you know, it smells like a sweet grain, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, I guess you know if it's made from corn. And it's it's distilled, then you know. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't imagine it'll be a giant column still like you would get for 
for Girvan or 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 Cameron Bridge or. Well, I can tell or, you exactly. Let's let's share with everybody what this actually is. <sighs> Uh, our first dram tonight, Jimmy Legg has just bought me a dram scene. Roddy's voice is really soothing to me. It makes my whiskey taste even even better. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Legg. It's yeah. lovely to have you, my friend. It's always great to have you here, even when you're being nice to Roddy. Cheers. <laughs> you do have a soothing voice, actually. And I'm going back to even, the, even before I knew you were Roddy, you were hosting tastings at Good Spirits Company and things. And I remember yeah, the way, the kind of calm, soothing way that you presented whiskeys. Um, anyway, I'll tell you that what we're sipping just now, and I've got a wee overlay here to share with everybody. This is a Mexican whiskey. This is from the only whiskey distillery or exclusively whiskey distillery in Mexico. And this is called Abasolo. This has been provided to me by uh, Ben Boyers down at the Spirit Specialist, a brand new store um, down in uh, East Yorkshire. And Ben and I were on uh, Vin's channel together to celebrate uh, Vin's uh, milestones recently. And he got talking about this whiskey, and I spoke to him about this upcoming stream that we had, and he sent me up a couple of samples, along with a really cool uh, Nixta Mexican liqueur um, and a Lindor's Abbey Aquavite. The Aquavite I've tried before, um, but I've not tried the Mexican liqueur before. But I feel like this one tonight, this Abisolo, might be a good start. And as Roddy said, nice clean, very clean, right? Sweet, easy, and light, 43% ABV. Um, but I've got a wee, um, he's given us some, some insight into this, and, and he's, he's talking about the Abisolo, it uses nixtamalized, with an N, nixtamalized corn, an ancient technique which steeps the corn in an alkaline liquid, breaking down different parts of the corn into plain water, plain in, uh, in quotation marks and resulting in a richer, deeper flavour. This is the process used to make masa at the base for tortillas, tamales, etc. Abisolo is the first dedicated whiskey distillery to open in Mexico. And interesting, the warehousing has no walls. So the casks, a combination of virgin and ex-bourbon casks, are left to the elements. And that's from Ben. He sent that along to us. And I can also tell you that it's, that it's actually made in traditional, or what resembles traditional pot stills. Twice there's a comment on the, the chat there, Roy, from Whiskey Central. She's in Mexico. The whiskey is made with a hundred... Okay, you want me to pronounce that, Sheila? I wish you were here. A, oh, what's... Cacahuatzintl? Cacahuatzintl. Ancestral corn. So, uh, uh, so that corn is grown above 700 feet. It has to be grown at a certain altitude, 700 metres maybe. Uh, it has to be grown at a fairly high altitude. It's big, huge, chunky corn. It's massive. They also use a 4,000-year-old cooking technique called nixtamalization. There you go, where the corn is soaked in alkaline solution. Sheila is obviously uh, located. She's American, but she's located in Mexico. She she's very well placed to talk about this very whiskey. Double distilled in copper pot stills and aged for 24 months in new and used toasted American oak barrels. The majority coming from Buffalo Trace. There you go. This is a this is a nice, easy entry into any flight, isn't it? I think uh, this a glass of this with a big chunk of ice in it would just be wonderful, you know? Um, Absolutely. You know, that, Absolutely. There, I have to say, for corn whiskey for me, and, and this is true of grain, because um, often when you're drinking a Scotch grain, you don't know if it's a kind of wheat or a corn. Or, but sometimes they can be overly sweet, whether it's just the mood or the condition of your palate when you come at them. I can mm -hmm. find them just a wee bit too sweet, and I, they're kind of one dram events for me. I'm finding this Moorish. Maybe it's just tonight. Maybe it's because I've been looking forward to tonight, and this is much more palatable than I expected. <laughs> but I'm finding it quite Moorish. It's not so sickly to me. I, I I know what you mean about the sweetness thing, but sometimes you do get the mood for a a really sweet dram. You know, like I'm not really a bourbon drinker. It's like you were saying, Roy, like you, um, scotch is my thing. But every now and again, a, a, a glass of bourbon, you know, with a chunk of ice is a real, you treat. know, it's a sweetie, it's a, it's a one-off treat, and you have it as a sort of dessert whiskey, you know, because it is a lot sweeter, you know, and... I think that's honestly. I think that's for me as a as an enthusiast. I think that's why I gravitate towards higher proof bourbons, higher ABV, because the sweetness comes along with a lot of spice and grip and boldness, um, amplified by the higher ABV. I think um, mm. 
if 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 bourbons are forty five and below, I can sometimes struggle with them a wee bit if I'm honest. But the higher proof can help me kind of sit up and pay attention a wee bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you fully. A, a, a bourbon poured slowly over a chunk of ice is a treat, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, like yeah, like yeah. so many sweet whiskeys. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Pollack is saying it's just the vaccination. It might be, Chris. It might be. <laughs> and uh, Paul McDonough is in tonight. Paul McDonough, evening, Roy and Roddy. Well, Paul, it's wonderful to have you in, my friend. Brilliant to have you here hanging out with us. Looking forward to you being the barman, honestly, Paul. Aye. I think we all are. But See it's that. nice that I can be a virtual virtual barman to you for a wee change. Paul McDonough, just everybody, uh, welcome Paul into the uh, the lounge tonight. He is uh, the guy behind Glasgow's famous Bon Accord Whiskey Bar. One of Roddy and I's favourite wee pockets of peace in the mm. whole city, I think we would agree. I can't wait for my first pint of Cascale at the Bon. I think I'll weep. I think I'll literally greet <laughs> because it's just, it's almost at the point where I'm nervous about going back out into public spaces again. It's been so long that you're going to forget yeah. what it's like. And, but just that idea of something tall and cold and poured for you that's handed over the bar and fresh and okay, I'm starting to weep now and I'm not even yeah. there yet. <laughs> so I think we have to say, can, I'm going to suggest a scoring system tonight, Roddy. Okay. Would it be rude to try and um, bring back the scoring system from the Whiskey Woman channel? Oh, uh, so that was uh, either, well, it started off as being very simple. It was, a dram was either bra or no. That's exactly, uh, exactly it. Bra um, or no. But then, of course, it quickly degenerated so that uh, we were kind of cheating because your tone of voice would be, or else she might resort to hand gestures, you know, like, bro, for uh -huh. example. <laughs> um, I mean, it can be hard to, it can be hard to have a come down on a black or white mm -hmm. decision with so many things. But, but yeah, let's try, let's try that. Um, I mean, to start with, this is bro. It's bro, isn't it? You know, aye, this is I, I don't, I don't think it's, it's, if it, if this was expensive, I don't think people would be charging out to buy lots of it. But I think it's a curious thing. I think it's light. It's easy. Mm -hmm. For Mexico's first genuine whiskey, I think this is a pretty good place. Heritage is here. You know, they've gone with their own product. They've not tried to be anything else. They've tried to just be Mexican whiskey mm -hmm. and shown that it can be a delightful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Aaron McFault is saying... We demand the return of the whiskey woman. <laughs> um, the that was a, a two person operation, uh, and the other half of that show is sadly um, seems to be too busy to. I'll I'll I'll, I'll mention that that uh, there's that that request has come up again, and she'll punch me or something. Well, <laughs> Kat Katrina was there. But we all kind of, we all just kind of felt like the whiskey woman was actually Roddy Graham. <laughs> mm -mm, mm -mm. The, the, the Katrina, Katrina was very much part of the team, but the title was named after Roddy, Roddy Graham. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that you were the whiskey woman. We would, we would love to see it back on. You remember the video I shared from my favourite video that you ever did with the first time you joined us was the Spring ah, Bank Spring 12 Bank. cast strength. Where you basically gave a review without giving a single tasting note, start that's to finish, right, right. Right, and right. but it was perfect. It was exactly what it was deserved <laughs> for, for the drama in hand, and you did it brilliantly and so funny as well. The point that you disappeared off camera and then your head came up from <laughs> the bottom of the table, and and what what, you, what I didn't notice the first time I watched the video is that the, it's going down the level in the bottle is going down and down like this, and there's only like this much left at the end. Brilliant, just brilliant, good fun. YouTube gold. I shared it with everybody. And uh, I, the Whiskey Woman, the content is still up there. If, the, if you're going to go in and watch one video from the Whiskey Woman, that's where you start. Springbank 12. Spring Bank 12. Yeah, in my opinion. The, that's the only one you need to bother with. It's downhill all the way after that one. Uh, no, not at all. But I never got to the bottom of why all those, uh, we'll not get into it tonight, all those odd objects, those kind of eclectic things were brought to the table. Um, just... Um, I'd, I think because the first one we recorded, we'd left stuff lying there. 
like you know, and it was like, ah. we've, we've made a mess, so right, we need to pretend that's part of the the set, part of the, part of the set. <laughs> <laughs> so we need like, to a mess. But uh, you were shoot, you were shooting that at Good Spirits, weren't you? Good Spirits Company. Aye, aye, aye. On yep. on a on a phone camera, um, very amateurish. Not like you, Roy. <laughs> Honestly, but that's where everybody starts. Is they they all just kind of sit in front of their phone, or they make use of what they have. And then little by little, they just kind of add, I was going to say upgrades, but it's just, honestly speaking, layers of complexity is what's added. <laughs> um, Error is saying, I, I got that we demand the return. And Jimmy Legg is asking if this is comparable to a Lowland. I would say no, this is not cereally and malty. This is sweet no. to me. This is... Um, I, I mean, it really so, is. The, the grain character is... is uh, you know, it's, the yeah. great, it's front and central. You know, it's very, very clearly a, a corn whiskey. You know, it's got that, it's got that sweetness to it. Um, Is, you get a wee bit of kind of burnt bread or burnt toast. Or maybe not burnt, but just well done. Just kind of like toasted. It's toasted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, 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 hi. I would have a bottle of this quite happily. Honestly, I think this is a nice <laughs> thing to have around for people. And it drew from Arizona saying, is that a, a Gaelic term? Bra it's B-R-A-W, bra. And it just means really nice, good. It's a, a very positive statement. Bra, very good, or no? Uh, obviously no. So uh, yeah, that's, that's where nice. Katrina and Roddy uh, got that from. Um, and Whiskey Central is saying that was Springbank, right? I absolutely, Sheila, it was. Very okay. Cool. I think starting off quite well. I'm not sure how number two is going to go. Is that you got number two up at your nose? No. Hey, I was just saying goodbye to number one. Um, well, I've got a wee drip left for the end. I'm going to try aye, and be careful aye. tonight. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is a challenge on the notes. See, um, the, the the thing about this one is that uh, I think if you, if you take your whiskey hat off and put your gin hat on, Ah, you know, it's because it's really, it's to me, this is very, it's it's grassy, you know, it, it smells like green, it smells of hay to me. My gin it's, hat is a tiny wee thing that wouldn't fit my massive heat. It's not a big thing that I do. It's, I, I do occasionally have a gin, but it tends not to be neat. It would be with a mixer. Let's share with everybody what we're about to um, sample here. This bottle looks fairly innocuous. This is Icelandic whiskey. And this was sent to me by uh, my friend and fellow barfly, like local uh, countryman, city uh, uh, dweller, and just general classy friend, Scott Monroe, Kilted Moose. You all know him as Kilted Moose. He sent us these samples. He'd been on a trip over to Iceland. He went and visited the distillery. And of course, the souvenir that he brought home was this particular release, which is there, uh, sheep dung smoked. Uh, release uh, uh, sheep dung smoked reserve specifically they're calling it 47% ABV it is I think and I have to say would I pick this out as dung on the nose if I was smelling it blind I don't think so but I'm getting animal feed and farmyards from this It's, it's it, you know what it's the, the closest scotch analogy to in this to me is Kilkerran it's, it's got the grassiness that, that I find in a lot of Kilkerran. Right, okay. Um, I mean, it, it's but it's much more herbal than any than any Scotch whiskey. Um, I really think if you if you if you can convince yourself you're a gin sipper, Roy, then this this drink makes a lot more sense. So what? That's what I want to do. You, certainly, you probably when you're pouring it for folk, you probably most of the time don't necessarily want to tell them what's been used to dry the barley. Let's talk about that for a second. Sheep dung smoked. Let's talk about that process. So they're, they're using malted barley here, but they're drying it over a fire that's fueled by, I guess, dried sheep dung. But then, you know, arguably, uh, peat is going to have a component of uh, <laughs> a small fraction of sheep dung in it, isn't it? You know? There's a wee bit of shite yeah. and peat, is, is what you're saying it's, there. There's going to be a fair bit from aye. all sorts of flora and fauna, right? Not just sheep, I guess. Aye, aye, aye. Prehistoric <laughs> humans. 
there is a nice aromatic side to it, right? Mm -hmm. Once you once you let yourself get past the, this, because you're vi I'm visualizing sheep dung. Sorry, it's just it's, I think it's natural. But if you go past that, I'm not finding much in the way of fruit. What I'm getting mostly is greener notes, maybe maybe grass, but dry grass. The it's it's very much for me the dried, yeah, grass and straw and hay. Um, Absolutely, like a barn. Yeah, but, but you you know that dried the dried pellets that you would feed to. Well, I guess sheep as well, horses and things. You know, the dried compacted oh, pellets, aye, 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 which aye. is par partially made, I think, from from draft, right? Mm -hmm. From used barley, um, often. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's like when you go to a pet shop and you're sort of yes, you're yes. rummaging around, rummaging around in the bins at the back amongst the feed. It's not off-putting. I've not sipped it yet, but let's have a wee. Well, it, it, when I when I was running through the lineup, Roy, it was it's it's wildly different from everything else tonight. You know, and it really is. It's like as if you'd had given somebody. A, a bunch of whiskies and a gin, you know, it's really that far off the beam. And yet, on the palate, have you sipped it yet? I have, hi, hi. It's Is not it? as challenging on the palate. Mm -mm. I think, I think you can taste the the cask on on the palate. You know, I'm I'm getting oak spice. Um, Maybe that's I'm getting, the thing. I'm getting the sweetness of. Uh, the, the barley as well that you know the 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 smoke character and and it's not you know it's not like a peated whiskey it's not like you know it's grassy it's not burnt you know it's no, absolutely right it's the smoke is super gentle yeah i just want yeah. to say thank you to whiskey works graham who bought me a dram a minute or so ago just popping in on quick up early for return to work prep. I hope I've not missed you, Graham. Uh, house move all complete. It's been a busy few weeks. We'll catch up on the repay slant you. Graham, I wish you all the very best in your new home. Um, I hope it's okay for me to be raising a glass of Floki sheep dung reserve <laughs> to toast you in your new house, my friend. Uh, I wish you many happy times. And uh, thanks for your drams. Thanks for stopping by to say hello to us. And thanks for picking up on the replay. Cheers. <laughs> Poor Graham. Um... Drew is asking if my gin hat would be made of foil. I will. I suppose if it's made from foil, it's easy to reshape and make it fit as I go along my gin journey. <laughs> I can grow into it and make it a bigger hat. And uh, Jimmy Lag is starting to question Roddy's credentials if he's comparing it to Cochran. I have to say there isn't a, there isn't many folk that would sit down. It would take somebody of Roddy's credentials yeah. to sit down and pick out. I know exactly what Roddy means when he says it, but it's not something I would be able to draw a comparison to. But what he's doing is reaching for a tasting note. Let interrupt if I'm getting this wrong, Roddy. But what he's doing is reaching for a tasting note that he recognises in Cochran and probably thinks I might be able to recognise the same trait and then pick it up in this as well. And that's exactly right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes in Cochran, when I get it, what I'm talking about, I go in the kind of multi direction. I'm thinking cereal and things, but actually it's a it's a it's a greener drier grass note. It's not as simple as just kind of a uh, cereal oatmeal yeah, type. Yeah. I, 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 I do often find that, that dried grassy note in Kilkerran. Um I mean, you know, the uh, the bourbon, but the 12-year-old, you know, not the not the various specials. The other, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely st stretching the point now, but uh, you know when when um, uh, Kilhoman do their own malting, you know for their hundred percent Isla, which is the, and that's hey that's a lot smokier than this, but it, it's a little in that version of Kilhoman. There's a kind of sort of grassy funk, which oh which I absolutely, is, I know, the Kilhoman. I actually said to Anthony Wills. Uh, to the point he laughed out, he had a belly laugh at this, but I told him that the fourth edition I have, and I still have it, and I've had it for a long time, smelled and tasted of hamster cage to me. And I, and I didn't mind it. I didn't really, I wasn't put off by this. <laughs> and and he I'm said, oh, I need to I need to let you try the latest one, the latest one. Now, this, the 10th edition had been out at that point, so I showed you how long I've had this fourth edition. And clearly there's a, there's a, a marked difference but even in the 10th edition, it's still there. But it's at a point that it's it's not overt. It's not what it leads with. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas yeah, in the yeah. fourth edition, you sip that and you've still got that. And you mentioned pet store. Literally, as it's got <laughs> that dusty, grassy farmyard thing that that was just so so strong it made it difficult for me to enjoy even in a fairly uh highly peated isla like that ross Fudd is asking if it's like alfalfa pellet alfalfa pellets don't know I'm what not, that's no, like. is, that, is that what oh, those yeah. pellets are that i'm talking about there alfalfa pellets are different altogether right don't know i mean that's the you, i don't think you get alfalfa in this country do you you know yeah alfalfa would be something you would pick up at a a Whole food store or something, not something I'm too familiar with. Mm-hmm. Ross, I guess, uh, um, <laughs> that, that's Thomas Elmer Ross. But, um, Thomas, I hope that that's uh, <laughs> I guess maybe maybe something similar. There's the I'm liking that tasting note there from mood to move rodents and sawdust, rodents and sawdust. <laughs> what, I sh- what I should have done is I should have released what we were sipping tonight in advance. Uh, but I never thought to do that. How does your taste memory get formed to come in a hamster cage on a pallet? When I was a kid, I always had hamsters. And if you let a hamster cage go, because when you made it fresh, when you put the, the sawdust in and you dressed the cage nice and fresh, it was lovely. And you had that kind of wood shaving smell and all the nice smells and the fresh food and everything went in. Two days later, when the little thing had peed all over the cage and it was all sodden and things, then you started to get these much more kind of, let's say, aromatic smells and things that's much more farmy, much more pet store-like. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of the, the note I was getting. But it, but but you're absolutely right because it's down to personal experiences and what your library and what you remember and what you identify those smells as. Um, I will be searching for for uh, the grassy things in Kilkerran going forward. Scott Monroe, actually, who shared this whiskey with us, that's the note he picks out on Kilkerran. Um, and I remember in a, a V-Pub recently, Scott was able to pick out Kilkerran on a blind flight based on that note. Right. So mm-hmm. I know it's definitely there. Um, so do you think that's why he bought this whiskey? Because it reminded of him of Kilkerran? I don't know. I, I, that's right. I don't know. I never even made that. I had that thought and made that connection. Um, if Scott's in, if he can tell us, maybe he reminded him of Kilkerran. But what are we going to say about this one then? Bra or no? Um, in itself, it's bra. You know, it's an, it's a fascinating spirit. Um, and, it you know, it's a really interesting flavour. But in a, in a flight of whiskies, it's, it's, it's too far off the beam, you know. Uh, so... Do you know what it reminds me of a wee bit now that we're talking about it and sipping it there? You talked about gin. When you were first on in December 2019, the guy who's hosting the quiz at the end tonight is Menno from Belgium, bought us a 17-year-old Jennifer Jennifer from Belgium, yeah. and he shipped mm-hmm. it to us. And I poured it for you blind. And you, 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 as soon as you knew you weren't drinking whiskey, you guessed it as Jennifer. Mm-hmm. There's a we, there's a kind of note a bit like that in it. The yeah, I I, I can absolutely see that. It's um, it's the herbal thing, you know. And if if you, you know, if you're stretching the point a bit, then grass is a kind of herb. So, I mean, hey, green that aromatic aye. tea that you get, the oh I kind of Asian teas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have to say, Roddy, I'm just going to go straight and say, and I'm surprised at this because when I first put my nose in it, I thought, oh, no, I was strapping in for this one. But that's bra. It's uh, a lovely know, thing to talk about. It's interesting. And I as soon, know what you mean by- she doesn't need <laughs> And as soon as somebody starts to say, but, but, but sheep dung, what are you talking about, sheep dung? Then you just that thing that you said, surely if you're burning anything at one point, there's, there's been some kind of shite involved in all of it. Okay, not all, not complete, but <laughs> the, it's like the smoke from burning it. Hi, see that sample, that very generous sample that you sent, Roy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let people taste that next to gin. Uh, sorry, Scott sent the samples, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, this is from Scott. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna blind taste people that with next to gins and I, I think it will sit in it will sit there 
a lot better than, than you know, it's a good spirit. It just doesn't sit in a flight of whiskies, you know. Yeah, it is quite, it is quite aromatic, quite herbal, quite yeah. green, but remarkably enjoyable nonetheless. I'll move on so, to the next one. Sorry, go ahead, Roddy. Just as a whiskey, that would have to be a no. As a whiskey, it's a no. Aye. As a drink, bro. Aye. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Roll, Roland Whiskey Radar say, even Roy just sneaking into the late pub, what did I miss so far? Any uh, Rodball <laughs> favourites? <laughs> uh, well, I think the first two so far, we've had an Abisolo Mexican corn whiskey, and we've just finished an Icelandic sheep dung smoked reserve from a uh, from Ben Boyer's, the first one, and the second one, the sheep dung uh, smoked reserve from Floki, uh, Icelandic whiskey was from Scotland Row. Um, and I have to say that the only no so far is Roddy has said no to the Floki, but only with regard to being whiskey. Um, but we both like them as drinks. Greg's whiskey guy is saying, yep, uh, took it to an SMP, um, but the sherry casts in there are tricky. I thought it was rye first. I'm not sure what, uh, that's maybe a chat, uh, 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 Greg, between you and Menno. Oh, I okay. It's maybe the, the Belgian... Jennifer, uh, Greg, and uh, Menno are talking about. Let's move on to number three, Roddy, because we've got a fair few to tear through tonight. We've got uh, plenty of oddities. Do you have a middle ground option? Bro, something, no. Any ideas? Yeah, for Roddy to say no and me to say bro, surely that's middle ground, right? <laughs> it's like, we're going to try like and It's like I was saying when you, when you brought it up, bro, you can cheat a bit and you can go Bro, no, bro. Like this. <laughs> aye. So the there's always wiggle room, you know. I mean, we we are making the rules, right? Exactly that. And and in context, in our in the context of our discussion tonight, hopefully people pick up the subtleties. Uh, Richard Agnew is saying uh, that was sorry, that was Richard's comment. I picked up there. Whiskey hike is saying better late than never. Glad I managed to catch you live. Working nights makes it a wee bit difficult from time to time. Today's topic sounds fascinating. Slanchiroy, Slanchirodi. Well, it's fascinating for me, and what's already fascinating is I've just nosed number three, and never have I nosed this and not thought that is bold, different, and quite strange. But tonight, after the first two, this is actually nose. Maybe it's just after that number two. It's nosing more like whiskey than I'm used to it nosing. Are you familiar with this one, Roddy? Um, I had it once years and years ago, um, so I don't remember it at all. So we're sm- this is a Texas. Uh, let's. I don't know. And I think in North America they're able to call it whiskey, but and when it's sold in the, in Europe. The word whiskey doesn't appear anywhere on the packaging as far as I can uh, tell. This is Balconis Brimstone. I find this a fascinating whiskey. I find it a fascinating flavour. It's a very, very difficult thing to recommend because if somebody was loving Isla whiskies or Peaty Smoky whiskies, this is not easy to recommend despite the, the smoky PT or the smoky side of this whiskey. This is Texas Scrub Oak smoked. So Scrub Oak, I understand to be a native tree um, of that part of the United States, and uh, they're burning this in order to create this smoke. Scrub oak is a small, kind of more uh, narrow-limbed or a smaller, finer tree, um, much smaller than a traditional oak. Um, and they burn this to smoke this whiskey. But the reason that I've not put this at the start or the end, where we're talking about grain or we're talking about maturation, is because of, and I need some insight from you if you have any on this, Roddy, because they don't smoke the grain. They don't dry the grain. This is corn whiskey. And they don't dry it with the smoke. They actually smoke the corn spirit. And some kind of secret process that I've never been able to get to the bottom of how they're actually doing it. I can't even imagine the apparatus that could do such a thing on such a scale. But brimstone, before it ends up in, uh, I think, virgin and refill casks, is as they smoke the liquid. So I'll be I'll be monitoring the chat if you can chime in with any insight that you could have there. Um, so to say to start with, I don't know the process at brimstone uh, at balconies. Um, um, I imagine that it's going to be something like a a hookah. You know where where you're just you're bubbling the the smoke through the liquid. 
Um, I mean, it, it, it's possible, I guess, if you if you have filled a tank with liquid and then pumped smoke into the uh, the top half of the tank, then it would, you know, it would be absorbed into it. It's like you know when you when you go to a fancy bar and they do a smoked cocktail. Yes, and and, and they've got that kind of bell jar that they drop over. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, the just the proximity of the smoke and some of it gets absorbed into the liquid. Um, I was, um, so there's there's a f fairly new bottler uh, in Scotland called Little Brown Dog, um, yes. based in based in Aberdeenshire. Um, Cracking value on their uh, twenty two year old blended malt. Aye, aye, yeah, 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 yeah. If you can get it, I think it's all sold out now. Maybe. Um, the, but Andrew Smith, that's one half of Little Brown Dog, um, he's been sort of mucking about with his, with his drums for years. And I remember, I think maybe about a decade ago, he decided he was wanting to explore uh, the, the provenance or the terroir of peat. So he, he got people at uh, five different places in Scotland um, to send them peat samples. You know, uh, he got some from uh, adjacent to Laphroaig, the south coast of Isla. He got some from uh, near where Highland Park are, um, Hobbister Moor. Yep. Um, some from, you know, he's based in Aberdeenshire. So all over Scotland. And then he sent these little kits out, these uh, with test tubes and little Bunsen burners. Um, and the idea was that you need to burn the peat and then uh, somehow introduce the smoke into a whiskey of your choice. Um, and uh, I can't remember now what whiskey I used, uh, but I, I was doing something like what, what I just described, where you, you just capture the smoke in a, an upturned glass and, and put it over your dram. Yes. You know, uh, and um, it was... The results were not good. It was, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> the well, the, the the thing is, when you burn something, like when you burn peat, it's very sulfurous. You know, there's loads of sulfur compounds in it, and that was immediately apparent when you tasted the liquid. You know, whereas this, you know, which is, the, you know, that I, I mean, I don't know what the composition of that scrub oak is, whether it's less sulfurous, but and I guess it's been matured after they've done the. The smoking process, but this is, you know, I think this is a fascinating liquid, you know, and it, it it's it, the smokiness isn't that strong to me, you know. That's it's, right. I would, there's so many the other, smoke. there's so many other flavors beyond the smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For your it's, asking for your attention, you know, it's like it, it's. I mean, I'm getting a really strong chocolate note on this, um, right? I, which I don't know where that's coming from. Um, I, I get really. Uh, all, almost bordering on kind of medic medicinal confectionery like cherry tunes um, and, and that kind of really rich it, it makes me think burgundy and dark red this whiskey I know it's an odd thing to talk about but I just I want to mention this this whiskey quickly where it came from and things but you notice the little uh, overlay that I have there it actually says Texas at scrub oak smoked corn whiskey on the label this is obviously a European bottle and it doesn't say uh, whiskey anywhere on on the label that I can see here, and the reason for this is that it is actually a European 700 ml bottle, and this was actually sent to me by Stefan Novak. Uh, there's another Stefan Novak whiskey in the lineup tonight, but he sent this to me, and I think it was on the back of me talking about it in a comment or whatever. Um, and I have to say that I remember my first ever taste of this, and if I recall correctly, I didn't love it. I thought it was just odd. Now I don't feel the same way about it. I feel like I really quite, it might be a mood thing, but I feel like I really enjoy this whiskey now. The, this, this to me, I would say this is like a, a, a sherry monster. You know, it's, you'd have the bottle and you'd, you'd have one dram of it towards the end of the night. And the bat the bottle would last you quite a long time because it's pretty intense. And yes. 
um, it doesn't seem like there's much spirit character to me. You know, I'm guessing what we're tasting is is maturation and the smoking process. You know. Well, that's that's um, certainly true of Texas whiskey, isn't it? Just how fast it matures. Uh, there's a batch mm. number on this. Most, most Balconis uh, whiskies tell you the age in months <laughs> on the <laughs> bottle. They literally write it in months, but this one doesn't. It's just got a 10th of January 19 on it and a batch number there. Um, but we know that because of the, the pressure and the climate out there in Texas, uh, you know, it's dramatically fast maturation and interaction with wood that they're having out there. And, and I think that the environment, that, that maturation, everything imparts a kind of profile to Texas whiskies that even although that this is bizarrely different from all of them, it still has a bit of that there. If you've ever been on Texas soil and eaten the food there, specifically Texas barbecue, this makes perfect sense. Oh. All of the flavors in this, uh, you know, almost like, char and charred meats and the, the, lots of the the way that they dress the meat or flavor the meat the, you know the kind of uh, barbecue dressings and things corn the fact that there is some there is sweetness i know that you said there's not a lot of spirit here but i think there is some sweet corn there mm -hmm. and all of this in a weird way that's really difficult to articulate reminds me of texas it's mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. and, and I know that clearly it says on the bottle, and I know I'm drinking Texas whiskey, but there is something there that makes sense. The mm -hmm. food mm -hmm. and the air and the just being there. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the corn chips that you eat and the flatbread, the tortillas and the all these all these things, that there's a flavor here that, that just either works with it or reminds me of it, if that makes sense. I've, I've never been to, to Texas. Um, you know, but I'm I'm liking this idea of a, a whiskey that that um, I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I hate to introduce the terroir word, but it's you know it sounds like it's you know the the way you're describing it, right? It sounds like a whiskey that's exact that's completely embedded in the Texan culture. You know. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know that corn thing, the Tex-Mex thing. Um, you know, the, the fact that they're just eating outside all the time and barbecuing, cooking things over smoke and open fires and uh, cooking things in smokers and all of these things. All of these flavours that I'm talking about are not like subtle, delicate experiences. <laughs> you know, it's full on. Um, and as if it's not bold and full on enough for you, they add in all these spices and things as well. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. heat is brought about by it. So I think it sometimes takes a really bold experience like this you know, to compete with some of the, the cuisine that you might be enjoying out there. Yeah. The, you know, the, there is one uh, Balcones whiskey that I've been lucky enough to taste quite a few times, the Baby Blue. Yes. Um, and this is absolutely at the other end of the scale from this. Yes. You know, that that's the, the, the Blue is another one that you could enjoy over a big chunk of ice. Yes. Uh, but this is... I mean, I'm, I know I'm repeating myself now, but this is this is like the Texan equivalent of a sherry bomb. You know? Ah, that's right. It's it's like a really heavy digestive style. Yeah. After a meal, spirit. Aye, aye, aye. And that bottle will last you a while, Roy. Well, I'm I'm every time I go back to it, Roddy, I have to say I'm enjoying it more. And I think because of how curious it is, I think once lockdown opens up again and people are able to come to the house again, this is exactly the type of whiskey that I would be pouring for whiskey heads that come to the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's like, okay, here's something a wee bit outside your comfort zone. Here's something a wee bit different. And maybe in order to excite them and get them enjoying something new, or maybe just to reassure them that what they're already enjoying is the right track that they're on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's nice to have the, a contrast like this. Would yeah. you rate this? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just thinking, like, versus you know, compared with number two, like you don't, you can, you can safely drink this with your whiskey hat on, you know. Uh, I, you know, that's an easy one to give to to Scotch whiskey drinkers. I, and to answer your question that I think was coming up, uh, bra, I finished bra, the glass, but in a very unique way, right? 
Oh, aye, 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 aye. Um, I've I've got to, I've, go ahead. I've just, I was going to say, I, I think the, you know, the, it's kind of weird how I'm, I'm not, I'm really not seeing very much smoke in this directly. And it's like whatever, whatever maturation process they've done, it's, it's clearly a, it's taken a different path from from a PT Scotch whiskey. You know, there's I can't, I really can't find a lot of obvious smokiness. Again, it's an aromatic thing. Aye, um, and I think it is, it's almost reminiscent of the smoke that you might experience when you walk into a, a barbecue, a Texas barbecue joint, yeah. Salt Lake barbecue, one of those places. It's just amazing. I've been out a couple of times on to visit the guys over in Austin at the Whiskey Tribe, and they, uh, it, it's it's um sometimes I feel like the only thing that's connecting uh, that culture and mine is our language. It's a completely different world. Everything is different and fascinating for it. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Dave Cummins is saying, eh, it's the COVID shot. He's laughing at me. Stefan Novak is saying, for me, it's like eating pistachio ice cream next to a tire fire. Wow. Fantastic. And Jimmy's saying it. Jimmy Legg has got a good point. He's saying, should this have been saved for last? Well, no, because maybe, uh, Jimmy, maybe you've got a point. Because of the boldness, because of the weight of it, but this is a process thing. So we've got kind of, kind of touched on the grain a wee bit there, how the grain's treated in the floki. So the Mexican was the grain. Uh, the floki was to kind of how the grain's handled. This is a process thing where, where the spirit is smoked. But I think often we've talked about this in the past that, yes, it's probably right to put the big, bold, heavy, high ABV, peaty, smoky ones at the end of a flight. That's traditionally the way to do it. But it doesn't always need to be like that. It can be. And the reason that it's not at the end is because the two we've got at the end are probably the most extreme oddballs. We're saving the, the oddest to last, let's say. Um, Erwin is saying, okay, I'll try another dram of brimstone. Hi, Erwin. I think that was, that's how it was for me. Ben Demon Hunter is excited that we're talking about Texas. Good to have you in, uh, be, uh, Ben. And Drew's from Arizona is saying, same here for Dell back Distillery in Tucson. I've got a Dell back here. They use small casks, mesquite wood, yes, smoked for some versions, and most releases are just under two years old. Temperature ranges here help too. Uh, Drew, I've got a Dell back. Um, and I do need to open it at some point because it was another gift from the community. But we'll maybe have a topic that can cover that in the future. Dirty Dog is saying Balcones tasted like Texas. Tastes like Texas, absolutely. Mesquite grilled steak kebabs or kebabs with honey, cornbread, and beans. Scott Allen is saying, you're making me hungry. I'm making me hungry, Scott. Good to have you in. I hope Becky's doing well. <laughs> you're hungry for it. You're imagining a nice big sort of the, the, the steak and the, the brisket that they make. It just falls apart. It's so tender, and yet it can still be pink in the middle. How, how are you doing this? This is how are you doing this wizardry? It's magical. Scott Allen is is uh, it's good to have you in, buddy. Uh, Molas is saying it's a mesquite bomb, and uh, Steve A is saying salt like really isn't very good as barbecue goes even. I guess that for me as a visitor from the outside world, going to a Salt Lake barbecue is probably, a, you know, that huge thing is I'm not going to be able to determine the quality. I'm just going to be able to connect with those really bold, bold, different flavours at first. Um, but I, so we are, that's a bra, bra and a bra with the only no is that the number two, the Floki, wasn't really a whiskey for you. Let's mm -hmm. move on to number four. And uh, in number four, what we've done here is we've started to step into the world of maturation. Because for whatever reason, we've worked out that in Scotch whiskey and in most whiskies across the world, uh, oak seems to be the perfect vessel in terms of coopering, in terms of being, you know, the integrity of the oak once it's coopered, um, and also the way it interacts with the spirit. Oak has turned out to be wonderfully, serendipitously if so, but wonderfully um, a good at maturing and taking care of our spirit. But there are other woods out there that have been used in the past in Scotland, not anymore. Uh, we can only use oak, and most uh, maturation is done only in oak globally. But occasionally, there are some other casks that can be used that, that don't step outside or fall foul of any regulations. Number four, Roddy, is that very thing. This is the first time I've noticed this well. I'll pull up what we're sipping here. It's an Irish whiskey. 
And it's from Middleton. Um, this is from their Method and Madness series. So they have uh, single malts, they have uh, grain whiskies, they have various styles of whiskey. This is a, actually a single pot still. And this is from bourbon and sherry, but then it's been finished in chestnut casks. Mm. I'm searching for a chestnut note. The only thing I'm getting that would suggest anything chestnutty to me is a kind of heavily toasted caramel nut style. I don't know what it is. Caramelized nut. <laughs> Um, I, I think the, um, so, you know, Middleton, they're, they're, they're experts at playing around with their spirit, um, all the different spirit streams that they can create. And I'm sure that there will be barrels or tanks of liquid that are much more chestnutty than this one. I think what they've done here is, um, uh, so this is this is first and foremost Middleton, you know. It's the, yes. So so everything we know from Middleton, from Jameson to Paddy's to all the brands to all the pot still whiskies that they do, the Red Breasts and the Green Spots and the Powers and um, all the Powers whiskies. In fact, yep, ex exactly. That's Middleton. Yep. No, but I mean, I mean the, the 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 dominant character in this whiskey is is the distillery character. You know, they've 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 him, um, and I I've seen that in across the method and madness range that you know they're they're doing really interesting experiments, but they don't want you to uh, to go too far away from from being reminded that you're drinking a uh, Middleton whiskey. You know, so the, the, the chestnut maturation to me is it, it's it's made the whiskey super sweet. Um a, but it's and I, I absolutely see what you're where you're going with the the kind of toasty, caramelized, nutty character. But it's there's no there's absolutely no it's not dominant at all, you know, it's just it's added an extra note to the a, to the Array, the, the array of flavours that are that are in this already. Um, and Do you know I, what I else think, you know, I suggest to you, Roddy, as well? That one of the things that I enjoy most about single pot still Irish whisky is that really teeth coating waxiness that you that you normally get, even down at forty percent ABV, like the green spot and things. This doesn't seem to have that. I don't know if it's for you. If it's is it particularly oily or waxy to you? This this seems yeah. like a, a slightly Thinner, spirit, spiritier thing. I mean, this to me, this seems like a, a good example of the pure pot still style. Um, you know, it's it, it it's yeah, you get chunkier whiskies in this, but uh, you know, like uh, the, this is a good one, I think. Um, the I guess I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I've I've only I, I've tasted plenty of wine that's been matured in chestnut um, but the only other whiskey that or spirit that I've tasted that was in the chestnut was um, I think I was I mentioned it to you earlier Roy I, I did a, a a whiskey education course a, eight or seven or eight years ago with John Lamond yes he's a, a, um, for those that don't know he's a, a long-standing stalwart of the scotch whiskey industry you know like he's if you're watching john uh, leave a wee comment i know you tend to watch on facebook my friend we don't tend to see your your chat here but you often leave a wee comment on facebook afterwards right i've only done his beginners course i didn't i've not oh. yet undertaken the advanced course like you're talking about now yeah so the you have to um you have to come up with a, a presentation uh, you know you have to pick some very sort of narrow topic uh, and then do a presentation on it towards the end of the course um, uh, and one of the I, I boringly chose reflux as, as my presentation which 
<laughs> right. Uh, um, but one of the other people on the course uh, had, had a much better idea, which was that he bought New Make Spirit from, uh, a, I think it was Highland Park, and he got some wood samples from a, a timber merchant and got little bottles and put little strips of wood in with um, oak, chestnut, uh, cherry and acacia, I think it was. I, I didn't have time to look out my notes. And, you know, did them all for three weeks uh, and then let us taste it. And it was, it was super instructive because... Um, hey... Even if it wasn't nice, even if well, you didn't it, it, something. The, the thing is that it was actually tasty. Like the chestnut was, because because what chestnut brings to a liquid is sweetness. You know, it's an it's a it's an open poured wood compared with oak. Um, so it's le You know, it, it makes for a, a leakier cask, but it, it brings it brings a real sweetness to the liquid. Um, uh, well, I think the acacia was weird, and cherry was was just unpleasant. Oak was, well, you knew where you were, you know, like oak, you could see that the liquid was on its way to being whiskey. But the, the chestnut, I think, it's a real shame that um, the Scot, like, you know, the, was it 1990 or 89 is the first mention in the Scotch whiskey regulations of oak specifically. And that was, to me, that... 1990? 1989. Oh, sorry, the, when the regulations uh, specified oak, that's right, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought um, you were talking and, about the first time oak was mentioned. I was like, what? All right. Yeah, that, no, that's that's right, Roy. The, and, until all the regulations before 1989 just say wooden casks. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you could have used anything. And to me, it's a, it's a real misstep to to rule out things like chestnut. Because, you know, like this is, I, 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 this is a, an I. A, a, a bra, sorry. A bra, um, another bra. A bra. Yeah. Um, and, a, you know, it's great for the Irish whiskey industry that they can do things like this, you know. And um, I, I, will make, I will make a wee point of criticism. Um, and it's maybe, I think maybe the Method Madness series would be one of these things that would do best by you lining them up and sipping them against each other um, in order to kind of pick it. But I think it's too safe. If you're going to put method and madness on something, you want it to be a bit more extreme. Now, I have to say that we, we have just been sipping Icelandic uh, sheep dung smoke reserve and Balcones brimstone and things. So, yes, this is probably in the wrong place in the lineup. Um, but this, it, it, I almost wanted more of, I wanted to be able to taste what the chestnut had done to this whiskey. And I'm not convinced that I can. Maybe that's um, more about me well, than it's about the whiskey. I, I, I think it's I think it's that real sweetness, you know. The um but you know, I mean it's it, yes, it's Middle, Middleton and it's their experimental series, so they're not making much of it, but it's still you know, it's Pernod Ricard and they're you know, they See, play it safe, don't they? You yes. know? Like they're they're they they're very happy to keep doing what they've been doing for a long time and doing it well, you know. I they, should, they I shout out where this actually came from. It is a it's a sample that was given to me by the industry, um, but this was actually given to me by Michael Henry, uh, who's uh, the master distiller at Loch Lomond Group. Um, but he gave me this uh, out of a conversation that we had about these very things. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as an Irishman as well, he's got a vested interest. I know that he enjoys Irish whiskies too, um, and uh, it was him that gave me gave me this. 46% ABV method madness. But when you were talking about the wood samples from the timber merchant, that's super interesting because when I started watching Ralphie going back, I don't know how many years, seven, eight, nine years, I don't even know how many years ago now, he was toasting things in his oven and taking pieces of wood and putting it into uh, white spirits and or young whiskies and all of these things way back in the day. And my friend from Canada, Graham Young, uh, gifted me this. It's a straight rye from Canada. Now, when he, in fact, I'll, I can show you exactly. Uh, when he gifted me this, uh, it was clear, and you dropped in this wee chunk of apple wood. Do you see it in the bottom? And every now and again, the apple wood is supposed to bring some nice spices and things to complement and uh, help the rye, I think. Um, and every now and again, I'll come in and I'll give this a wee turn and just turn upside down. It's taken a long time to take on any colour at all, this. And I thought it would be faster, and I started to take 
every few weeks take samples. And it was it really wasn't changing much at all, you can see. But in more recent times, it's time I take another sample, Graham, and pour it off to the side. You can see that this is happening. So this is kind of a fun thing to do um, at home. But I was going to ask you about that. Do you think you need to toast them? Um, I can't remember what... So it was a fellow called Chris uh, who did this, and he the inspiration that he took was Ralphie. Um, ah, right. Um, he'd, okay. he'd seen Ralphie's uh, uh, toasting experiments and, and decided to do the same, I think. It is a while back. I remember that he, he, the the key thing that he had to be sure of was that the wood hadn't been treated at all. Uh, and I, I guess he toasted it, but I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Um, I would think. I mean, because the the point of toasting is to uh, to caramelize the, the sugars. Yeah. Yeah. To to sort of change the flavor compounds and to pull them to the surface of the wood. So, you know, I guess if that that's going to speed up the the, the maturation process, isn't it? That's right, that's right. You would have yeah. to think that the, the best results would be something mimicking what they do to the inside of a cask. Stefan Novak is saying, but it's good that Ralphie um, eh, prompted that wee experiment as well. That's kind of fun. St mm -hmm. Stefan Novak is saying there's a slightly uh, musty, nutty, a bit leathery note in there. Maybe linseed, aye. Maybe this is the chestnut cask he's saying. That's that's really interesting. I get linseed in, in pure pot still whiskey a lot. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need to get my nose in some linseed oil. The had a German cricket. Yeah. Cricket bats. I was gonna say I know that's what they use for in, in a cricket bats, right? And yeah. a German whiskey and an eau de vie matured in uh, chestnut and they had this. Oh wow. Right. Mm-hmm. And Ross is saying, I've said it, I'll say it again. If peat had not been used from the beginning, I think the SWA would outlaw it. <laughs> it could be true. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a lot to be said for the SWA being so protective, you know, because it's the, you know, the repute, it means the reputation of Scotch is, is as high as it is, is, but you do sometimes chafe against it, don't you? Okay. Well, sometimes, um, you know, that there's. I think there's actions and decisions made almost, um, you know, they're following the letter of the law rather than the spirit sometimes, and no pun intended, um, <laughs> you know, and it's almost like you, you almost feel like it's example cases or things. But, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think they often take a bit of a beating when it's not needed. Um, and it's kind of one of the points of tonight is to work out, well, there's an argument that you should not be all over the place, scattergunning, trying experimental, innovation, everything. Just make the best of what you're good at and make it as good as you can possibly make it. And if it's something that's steeped or, or uh, founded in tradition, where generation by generation this thing has been refined, there's an argument that that's probably a good path to continue following for as long as you can, especially when it comes to protected statuses and things like that. And not everybody being able to make the same thing. Uh, uh, Zane said, literally no one ever, Roy. I'm not sure what he's <laughs> commenting on. Neil Cochran is saying, linseed is like putty. Wow. That's, a that's another putty note in this. Yeah, that's another obscure note, though, because you don't get putty anymore, do you? Mm. So, uh, but I miss it. I miss it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime there was a fresh window pane put in, I used to pick the putty out and oh. <laughs> play with it. It's like, I'm sure my age really on that. Jordy V is in. Good to see Jordy saying the first compass box spice, spice tree was a prime example. Well, it's the one that springs to mind for me most of the time. But you know that thing of necessity being the mother of invention? It, I thought it was brilliant that compass box just changed the heads of the barrels to toasted French oak instead of having it. I mean, it's brilliant. It's perfectly within the regulations and they can still uh, have the same end result. Um, and and that, that is a wee bit unfortunate where I think that probably you could argue that the, they did follow the letter rather than the spirit of the, the law there. Um, a, the barrel staves were seen inside the cask as being an, an added or an additional non-traditional ingredient. And actually, it's saying SWA needs to develop what's called a regulatory sandbox, <laughs> find a way to allow and own innovation, but still distinguish it from the traditional product. 
I'd also argue that with all this innovation and all these world whiskies and everybody not under the same definitions or regulations and tightness that the SWA imposes on Scotch, it's almost like, well, Scotch, maybe there's an argument they should just be making Scotch and making it as good as they can make it. Um, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, the... Uh, you know, the, the Scotch whisky industry is big enough that um, it, it's... it's I'm, I was just in the middle of responding to Akshay's, Akshay's comment there about how they should have a regulatory sandbox. I think that's a brilliant idea, you know. Do you, do you but, mean like, like a wee incubator group that just kind of do skunk works type projects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but, but you know, and, you know, whether it's... Whether there's a sort of... You, you know, whether it's something that the... The Scotch Whiskey Research Institute near Edinburgh was to, was to do, or or whether you know whether you you would allow distillers, you know, a, I don't know, a duty exemption to to throw away a thousand liters a year of, of failed Aye. experiments or something, you know. Aye. But just the, 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 the I I would absolutely love it if there was a little bit of leeway for, you know, for saying okay, we're we're going to try stupid things, and. Some I, mean, will I work, guess if you're, you know? if you're talking about chucking away something, there is an argument that that exists, but they just can't label it at the end of the day as Scotch whisky, right? They can't brand it as a recognised Scotch whisky brand either. They can't call it Johnny Walker Spirit Drink. You know, they 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 have to be very clear about how they label it. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand what you're saying is that they lose a lot of the appeal then if they chuck away their branding and their, what they've built yeah, up over yeah, time. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting. Spawn Freak is, is confirming that putty is made from linseed. You learn yeah. something new every VPUB. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Morris is saying, I get putty from Pinderin uh, or Penderin. Um, straight, uh, uh, it's Pinderin, isn't it? Pinderin. Uh, strange at first, but lovely when you get used to it. I have to say, I agree with my friend Roddy on this one. Um, while it's not extreme in any direction, I think this is fairly safe whiskey. Mm -hmm. I think it's good whiskey. This is a bra for me, and you've already committed mm -hmm. to bra on your part as well. Yeah. Jimmy Legs bought me another dram. Jimmy, you're always so generous. He's saying if every single distillery made a 12-year-old and an 18-year-old aged exclusively in bourbonwood and released a cast strength with minimal filtering, it would be the I would be the happiest man in the world. I, I would love to compare them. Uh, it's a very pure thing, Jimmy, and I get exactly where you're coming from. I get it completely. Um, and I think that there's, there's, I'm not really making any argument in any direction here. That's the idea of kind of going off in these extremes. I'm taking one for the team. Roddy's taking one for the team. Stefan Novak, Michael Henry, Scott Monroe, uh, Ben Bowers, everybody that's going to be donating these with samples, we've all taken one for the team so that, Jimmy, you can just continue Unless I jump up and down and Roddy jumps up and down saying, we've found something amazing here. <laughs> you know, you're, you're literally, you're welcome to continue doing exactly that very thing and comparing things on a very kind of uh, granular uh, level where you're really getting down into the weeds and the nitty gritty of comparing distillery character and things like that. Uh, I've signed, just, I mean, I'm doing this tonight, but I've signed up for a, a tasting uh, with the Grail, another uh, whiskey shop in Scotland, um, who are doing a tasting of eighteen-year-olds, and that's that's the entire theme for the tasting. Just everything in the tasting is an eighteen-year-old. Fantastic, fantastic, yeah. Yeah. and and it's it's going to be interesting because there are a couple eighteen-year-olds that are out there that are exclusively bourbon, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's not all kind of a, a marriage of bourbon and sherry and things at that age. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one. The grail, the, the grail there up in, just beyond uh, Stirling, are they not? Uh, yeah, just at Dune. Uh, Dune, just around, that's right. Um, uh, they've been on the go for three or four years now. Part um, of the Hip Flask Hiking Club, is it? Uh, they're, well, the they're, uh, Jen, that's one half of the grail, is a member of the Hip Flask Hiking Club. Right, okay. Yeah, because so often when I get the tasting packs through, it's from... Jen, I think, then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Yes, I, I, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, Jen and Rachel. They used to work, I think, uh, what was the whiskey shop in Calendar called? Was it just the whiskey shop? In Calendar? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, nice. They right. it closed, didn't it? 
It was aye, the whiskey aye. shop. It was just the whiskey aye. shop. Yeah. That's right. Aye, aye. They used to work there, and then when that closed, they, they set up for themselves. Along the road in Dune. Aye, aye, aye. That sounds like a good one as well, 18-year-olds. And, and actually is saying anyone who's oiled a cricket bat as a young'un will love a linseed oil flavour. Uh, Dan Ford, I was saying, turning in for the night. Good night. Uh, good night. We'll catch up on replay tomorrow over my morning coffee. Dan, thank you very much for stopping by. I love anybody that picks this up on the replay. You're very welcome to treat it exactly like the pub. Lindsay Holman is saying, if a distillery produces something, they deem unsellable. What is the position? Re reference duty and tax. Uh, it's if they if they make it and they destroy it, I guess they've still got to pay the. Have they got to pay the tax on something they pour away? Maybe not. Don't, I've no idea. Um, I imagine that they'd get a lot of hard questions about that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we chucked it. Oh, we had to throw it away. Maybe have to throw it away under supervision, right? <laughs> I don't know. I've uh, no idea. Mm. Andrew Butler is saying, "What about White Mackay's Whiskey Works? They're supposed to be experimental." Aye, that's under a uh, Greg mm. Glass, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, and there has there have been a few kind of experimental, but it's it's kind of been experimental in the kind of spirit of this rather than any can anything that they can't call whiskey or work or pushes the envelope of as far as I understand it, right? Yeah, no, Greg's uh, um, very committed, or he's you know he's he's not. Um, uh, Oh, what am I trying to say here? He's very middle of the road in terms of, you know, he's not wanting to... Um, reinvent the wheel. Reinvent the wheel. He, want, he wants to sort of see what he can do. You know, it's that thing of, you know, you accept the constraints of the Scotch whisky regulations and then see what you can do. You know, once you impose those limits on yourself, what can you do? So the I think the most interesting thing that, that, that I've tasted out of them so far is the uh, the whiskey that's been matured just in Scottish oak, um, and that's that's such a scarce resource that there's hardly any of it, uh, and so far not enough to release. Um, and that's he's he's been I've seen him at a couple of events, and he's <laughs> this is kind of the crazy side of what he does. He's he, he's he's trying to persuade people to plant oak trees. <laughs> so that a hundred a hundred years down the line, we can have a Scottish because apparently, like, there's a difference between furniture oak and barrel oak. So the way that you grow oak to make barrels is 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 a different kind of uh, forestry. So the whilst there's good oak forests in this country, they're all for furniture, so they're useless for barrels because they're far too knotty. Aye, they're so not they, good for coopering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you. Yeah. So you, you, if you want oak trees for barrels, you plant them close together so that they don't have any side branches. Uh, and that's naughty with a K-N-O-T-T-Y. -T yeah, yeah, yeah. Many you. Um, yeah. I, 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 Glenn Goyne, you might remember about 15 years ago, Glenn Goyne had a Scottish oak release. It might even have been longer than that. I never tasted it. I do remember it, but I never got a chance to taste that one. I haven't tasted it either. I imagine it may be quite an expensive one to get a hold of now. Yeah. Ryan Sullivan's bought me a drama and said, great chat tonight, guys, on another engaging subject. Glad to hear Roddy's making the 18-year tasting. So you might see Ryan in there on that tasting as well. Fantastic. I'll look out, I'll look out for you, Ryan. I'll look out and for Graham you. Fraser, uh, Graham Fraser saying the Grail is partnered with the current calendar shop. Ah, right. I didn't know that. There, there's another calendar shop then, I guess, now. Right. And Aquavit, Peter Morris is saying, check out Perth, Sebastian, above. Roy, to answer your question, excise tax can be reclaimed if alcohol is not deemed fit for consumption. Ah. I wonder what the process involves. I bet you there's a lot of paperwork. Aye, and in, in, inviting an exciseman in to actually <laughs> taste and verify that it's minging or it's broken <laughs> and in some way not working. Absolutely. Right, let's move oh. on to the next one because... We're tearing through the time like we always do at the VPUB. I hope you don't mind. You can pick us up on the replay. Anybody that's picking up the replay, thank you. I will have chapter timestamps in the description box below so you can skip right ahead to the individual whiskies that we're trying tonight and all the discussion that goes around them. Let's bring up dram number five. This is an interesting one here. This is a whiskey released from Master and Malt uh, called The Rhythm and Booze, or in partnership with uh, The Rhythm and Booze Project. Um, and this is just a 10-year-old single malt whiskey, 
okay, uh, from a space side, an undisclosed space side distillery. Um, and th th there are some, the artwork and things does suggest some hints about this. You can start to see that there's some stained glass window going on with a guitar backdrop there, obviously uh, bringing in the rhythm and booze partnership and things. But the stained glass window gives a bit of a hint here because this has been matured in a very specific type of cask. And it bent my brain a wee bit because this is matured in a, well, I'll, let me bring up the, an image of the cask that this is. This is a bottle of Buckfast. Bucky. Um, this gets a really, really bad rap, and it's down to the way that this drink can often be uh, said to be abused in certain um, areas of the country. Um, and that's because it's very, very strong tonic wine. It's fortified wine, 15% ABV, but it's also full of caffeine. I think you'd have to drink half a dozen or more cans of Coke to get the same hit of caffeine. Um, and so this is used as a recreational, transitional thing. Hit the weekend, oh, you just want to forget your week and you're going to go to a certain place. Let's not talk about, let's not bring a class thing into this. Let's not bring into all the controversy um, about this. Um, it is what it is. It's made, it's perfectly legal. It's not always drunk that way by everyone, but this has a lot of kind of cultural, uh, urban legend type material around it. Wreck the Hoose Juice and uh, all sorts of uh, kind of wonderful uh, commotion lotion and things like this is called. But as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, Roddy, Buckfast tonic wine is not oak matured. It's not oak aged. I don't know. I mean, it's the, the when you, I have a, had a read at their, their website and their, what they go on about in, is their process for introducing iron into the liquid. Because uh, it is a tonic wine, so they, tonic, yes. they want to make something that will bilge up if you're an invalid. And from what I remember of reading it, it's like it's hard to get iron into a liquid in a way that's digestible. And they have somehow have achieved that. But yeah, I don't remember any chat at all about... Um, well, about if it doesn't build you up, it'll at least make you believe that you're built up. <laughs> <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, uh, yeah, it's a shame, really. The west of Scotland, is, you know, the, the reputation of Buckfast is not great. Um, and it does lead to trouble, you know. But um, yes. if you actually taste, if you actually taste it, it's not fun to drink. I've I've I've, I've had it twice, uh, and it, you know it's like it's like cold coffee. <laughs> you know, it's this. Uh, um, I have this, to, this. It's decades since I've tasted it. Decades. <sighs> I didn't like it at the time. Um, I didn't. Um, it it was just something that your pals would be buying and trying to encourage you to, because nobody had any understanding of alcohol. And alcohol, mm -hmm. when we first became of age to drink, was not something to sit and savour like we are trying, uh, generally in our life, I would suggest, but also tonight. Um, it, it was just something that was transitive. It was, it was a way of making a, a transition from boring to not so boring, if that made sense. And I think that's true for so many people. And when you have something like Buckfast, I'll bring up, I don't want to confuse it with whiskey. When you have something like this, this makes it easy. This makes it a very good lubricant for that to happen. Mm. High alcohol, sweet, super sweet, very easy to uh, drink to somebody who's not used to alcohol burn, let's say, and absolutely full of caffeine. So that idea you have some, you go over that, so you'll have some more, so you'll have some more. And interestingly, my friends, way back in the day in our teenage years, used it as a mixer. And they mixed it with, some of them mixed it with some cider. Some of them mixed it with some strong lager. You know, it's just, it was uh, crazy. And I'm <laughs> seeing some of them. I'm seeing some of them. I never got a taste for this stuff. Um, I, would, I would be maybe sipping some cider or something like that in my early years, mm. something sweet and easy. Um, but this was, uh, this remains today a very, very, very popular um, 
alcohol to buy. So Master of Malt, the guys at Master of Malt, I think what they've done here is they've got some casks, they've got some oak casks. They've managed to bulk buy some tonic wine. By the way, I am not suggesting that I know for sure this is Buckfast that they've done it with. The language suggests Buckfast, but in no place did they mention Buckfast. In fact, I'll read it out in a very small type at the front. Um, it might be uh, called tonic wine, <laughs> but this does not suggest medicinal or healing qualities. <laughs> they've, they've put this on the label. And then on the back, it talks about, um, in what believed to be the world's first, the Rhythm and Booze Project and Master Malt have teamed up to create a tonic wine cask finished experimental whiskey developed to push the boundaries of what's possible in booze. This bottling uh, brings together two icons, mature spirit from one of Britain's most renowned distilleries and to tonic wine drink of jo uh, and a tonic wine drink of jocular scoundrels. <laughs> And parishioners oh. alike. That's <laughs> shameless. I know, Jocular. jocular scoundrels. Uh, it's a taste experience like no other. So there you go, 46% ABV. Um, I paid about £46 for this. I was kind of hoping it would still be available tonight, but I checked um, yesterday, day before or whatever, and it was sold out. They had a 21-year-old blended malt that they did the exact same with. I didn't get to try but I have to say, Roddy, for me, I've had a drama of this uh, before uh, you and I got together tonight. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I know what I feel and think about it, but I don't want to. I don't want to kind of lead you in any way. Whiskey, what throttle is in? You might remember Daniel from Canada brought him into the shop uh, a couple of years back when he was over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, woman. See. <laughs> As far as he's concerned, you're the whiskey woman as well. You, you don't need to be having words with you, Daniel. Lindsay Holman is saying, uh, but on the subject of experimentation, something may be fit for consumption, but may not be the distillery's best interest to release. That's true. That's cask mm -hmm. brokerage exists for that reason, Lindsay. Don't worry. McAllen Fine and Rare saying Glengoy Scottish Oak finished whiskey is available for about 150 euro on whiskey base. Mm -hmm. So it's affordable. You can still get it. We're not recommending it. Nobody's tried it. Nobody's suggesting it's great whiskey. Yeah, Richard Agnew is saying, oh, no, Vietnam flashbacks, probably thinking about Buckfast. <laughs> um, aye, exactly. What are we getting here? The, um, we're, getting the, we're getting all the, the Bucky things. Let's have some of these comments. Fantastic. Uh, Al, that's from Northern Ireland. He's in Lurgan Champagne. That's one of the things that's very popular in Northern Ireland as well. Absolutely. Whiskey Throttle has bought me a dram. Please buy my Bud Roddy, a sweet, eccentric dram. I bought him a whole flight of them, Daniel. You would be proud of me tonight, my friends. Well, I didn't actually. Most of these, this is the first one that's actually come from me. The rest came from the community. Mm -hmm. Stella and a bottle of Bucky. Chris is saying, moan then. <laughs> Aye, here's all the Bucky comments coming in. Ben Marnock saying it notice of intention to destroy with a detailed <laughs> list of products and it exempts you from having to produce an EMCS to accompany the goods in place of the destruction. So there you go, Ben. Ben works for, in the industry. He's in a bottling ah, hall. Really? So he would know uh, the, the issues with things like that. Thanks for that, Ben. Yeah, that's talking about disposal of whiskey that's not fit for purpose and the, the responsibilities of tax and excise on it. Ryan is saying Red Bull gives you wings. Bucky gives you the ability to run through walls. <laughs> 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 Multi-mission men was saying, I tried the Buckfast whiskey Edu from distilleries, the, the Meniers. Not impressed, but not horrible. I would have to say that's the same as Buckfast. Sam Clark is saying, can you taste the toenails? And they... Uh, Erwin Laranaga seen a headache in a bottle, question mark? Absolutely. Uh, che is saying, uh, skateboarding in Glasgow, Renfrewshire is fueled by Buckfast. Could be, Royal 41 is, I've never tasted Bucky, but I've smelled it. And from what I remember, the overwhelming association I had was uh, Cavonia cough medicine. I could kind of get that. It does have that medicinal yeah. sweetness. Mm -hmm. Ryan Sullivan, Turbo Red Diesels, where you would have re replaced the black currant with Bucky. Oh, good, good times, says Ryan. And uh, Chris is saying, I knew a guy that loved a buck shake, bucky, and milk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, you're welcome to drink anything you like in the V-Pub, anything you want exactly the way you drink it. We are not making – if you're sitting there with a buck shake, you're very welcome here. Um, 
just don't expect me to be ordering a poor player is saying no. having to sign off early this evening, not blaming the buck fast, but I am from Renfrewshire. Blair, it's wonderful to have you in, my friend. Uh, Blair, was it you that sent me the the Palinkas, actually? I've still got you. I think it was you, Blair, that sent me a selection of Hungarian Palinkas. Uh, I still have. I organised my samples recently and I still need to get through them. Thanks for joining us, Blair. Thank you very much and good night. I should raise a glass to Daniel uh, and say thank you very much for your virtual dram. Good to have you in, big guy. Nice to have you here. Cheers. Um, this, this one. Sorry, on you go, Ray. So, I'll... Uh, no, I want you. I want you to share your opinion on this. Um, it, it's. Do you know that? Do you know when a whiskey gets a finish and the the finish and the whiskey sit beside each other? Right. That's yes. that's what this that's what this seems like to me. You know, it's like. You know, you can taste the grape juice. And you can taste the whiskey, and they're just not talking to each other at all. You know, it's, it hasn't worked. I don't think that's a no from me. I'm afraid it's a no from me as well. Yeah, and I right. would, I would absolutely echo your sentiment. The words I was going to use, it's like somebody's poured me a, a kind of regular entry level whiskey that you would buy at any kind of supermarket. Ten years old, absolutely sounds perfect to me. And a tablespoon of some wine, and just dropped it in the glass and left it for a wee while. That's what this comes across as. So, I mean, I don't want to knock it. I know they've done it for fun. It's flown out the door, and I think that it's flown out the door for a reason. I wouldn't imagine that they're going to... I hope they're not getting excited about making this a thing. They would have to find another way to do it. For, the, the first thing is it's a wee bit contrived. It's a gimmick. If Buckfast casks don't... or Sorry, excuse me. If tonic wine casks don't actually exist... Don't make them, don't crowbar them into existence just mm. to make a bit of fun. This is clearly mm. a gimmick here. And that's the reason I bought it, because I was curious. It was a gimmick. Um, there's a bit of relief to, to the fact that it's not something I'm going to be particularly excited to run back and try and secure another bottle in the secondary or whatever it may be. It is, it's a bit at odds with itself. It's sweet. It's, it would be difficult to articulate tasting notes that would that would express what I'm experiencing other than what Roddy has said, that there is two different drinks in the same glass. It's the Greg saying that sounds disgusting. It, I wouldn't even say it's disgusting, Greg. It's, it's just it's, it's just it's just it doesn't work, you know. It's the they're you know do you know you know when you get a, a port finished whiskey, port's the one that seems to divide Scotch drinkers, whiskey drinkers and you know and yeah. I love a I love a good port finished whiskey. I know you, you do. do. I know. You do get port finished whiskies that just they're doing what this is doing. They're just going on parallel tracks. You know they've they've never never done the the marriage thing that you get in a good in a good whiskey a good finish. I have to say, for me, any kind of uh, overtly strong wine, it has to be a bold spirit. Mm -hmm. So the thing that got me actually paying any attention to red wine was Greg Benson getting me to order a long row at the Bon Accord, a long row red. So, and, and I said, nah, just wine cast wine. He said, try a long row. I said, if you tried a long row red, I said, no, I haven't yet. It was the Malbec. So it was, I'm going back to 2016, 2017, whenever that release first came out. And I, I mean, just that. But long row is a powerful spirit in its own right. And, and it fights and easily takes that port, uh, sorry, that wine, um, that wine cask and, and, and kind of it makes it a coherent thing. Mm -hmm. But you're right, so many other uh, port whiskies, I'll, I'll include Quinta Ruban in that, honestly, I have to be in the mood for it. Uh, lots of other whiskies out there as well where it's kind of take it or leave it for me or they sit separate. Um, where the, sometimes, whether it's port or another kind of wine, the tannic thing, in fact, we had a tasting this week an amazing tasting, Roddy, you and I enjoyed this week, hosted by uh, Dewar's. And the only one that didn't do it for me was the opener, which was a lovely whiskey. It went down well with everyone. Um, interestingly, Scott Monroe and I didn't enjoy it that much, and it was just the red wine thing. Mm. That's the only thing that put us off. And I think it's the same with port for me. Mm. I'm a wee bit more sensitive to it. I think that might be what's happening here, but there's nothing tannic about this. This is just... It almost you could you could suggest that this has been sweetened. There's a sugariness to this. 
Sugary, yeah, that's that's a good word, Roy. It's, it is, it's, it is, it's like, you know, it, could, it says it's tonic wine, but it could equally, the cask could have been seasoned with Vimto. Vimto, <laughs> <laughs> Which, I don't know, do you need to explain Vimto to some people? People outside the British Isles, probably Vimto yeah. is a fruit-based carbonated drink. Um, that And, you know, I, I guess that it, it's grape, isn't it? Mostly grape. I think so, yeah. I mean, it's in Scotland, it's just Vimto. Just Vimto, yeah. Um, I, have, I can't even tell you the last time I saw Vimto for sale. Do they still sell it? The you, you get Vimto ice lollies. I like a Vimto ice lolly. I've not, I've never, I've not even seen that a Vimto ice lolly. Wow! But that's ah, Vimto on its own. Jimmy Leg is asking if I like port. Yes, I like port as a drink on its own when I'm in the mood. I like wine. When it, on its own, when I'm in the mood, all of these things. Vimto. <laughs> Burkfast. <laughs> I don't know. Not so much. Maybe. But, you know, if you're in the mood, and you're, you can kind of appreciate it as a thing in its own right. But if it's going to mix in some way with something else through sharing the same vessel or whatever it may be, it might seem like a fun idea. And who knows? Great things have come through craziness and serendipity. But I I'm not sure this has worked. Mm. I wouldn't be in a hurry to recommend this to anyone. If you've bought it, it's good fun. It's true to say that it's interesting. But I am going to predict that this will either get shared out in samples with people who are interested or it will sit in my cabinet for a, quite a long time as a curio. So that's our first straighten off for the night, I think. Mm -hmm. Roland Whiskey Radar is saying, as to port whiskies, uh, there is that 1989 Bomore with 23 years of maturation in port, which is really amazing. I know Bamore is often criticised, but that one is awesome. Uh, Bamore is uh, still remains a legendary distillery. Uh, I would just be cautious of recommending most or a lot of their official range um, to anybody that had a similar palate to mine, let's say. And Chris is saying, I had a keen to the ban earlier. I'm halfway through the bottle, and tonight is the first time I've really enjoyed it. I started on Peated Eyeless. Perfect, Chris. Glad to hear you're enjoying it as well. Uh, Keen to Ruban, I think, have up the age to 14-year-old recently and up to ABV as well to 46, I think. Is that the Keen to Ruban? I think, I think it is. Um, Vimto, sugar, sugar and sugar, says Neil Cochran. <laughs> well, this whiskey tastes a wee bit like sugar. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I, I think I've saved Roddy two of the most interesting to the very end. Can I just tell everybody, just, please stay till the end if you can. I appreciate time zones. It's difficult. Just... just just one thing before we move on from that. Um, yes. Just for those, Buckfast is so embedded in the culture of Lanarkshire that you can have things like this. <laughs> A removal company. <laughs> they've, they've they've stolen the typeface from from Buckfast and the yes. colour scheme. Um, yes, move fast. That, that only makes sense in Lanarkshire. That's too funny. That's too funny. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a wee, a wee company in Lanarkshire getting some fantastic exposure <laughs> and advertising. If you're thinking of moving to Lanarkshire, here's the boys that will take you here in a hurry. And they've got some really interesting hospitality to treat you with on the way as well. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Listen, if you are interested in staying for the quiz tonight, please stay because it's going to be a treat. It's menno. We know that the quizzes are brutal. They're just meant to be great fun. I am always in a cold sweat until I hit that five out of ten pass mark with a Menno quiz. Uh, but I'm looking forward to hey, Menno coming in and uh, entertaining us. I realise I'm keeping everybody late again, but it's good fun and I'm enjoying myself hanging out with Roddy. I've saved the last two drams till the end. If you do want to dip out now, please come back on the replay and then participate in these two last whiskies and Menno's quiz at the end. But these two I've saved till the end because I think... Uh, they are very, very interesting. And I've poured them alongside each other because I thought on paper it would be a good idea. But smelling them, we are not talking chalk, chalk, chalk and cheese. We are talking something even more extreme, I think. The only thing that, that connects these two whiskies is the idea that they are in some way smoked. Let's go with the most normal of the two. Uh, this is a present from my friend Bill Drum in the States, in California. He brought this over in 2019, and I had the barefaced cheek to take this to Isla with Scott and Bart from the Scotch Test Dummies and Bill, and we all went over there and we sipped this on Isla. 
But what I actually did was I took some native spirit back to where it was born. This is Isla Whiskey. Shipped is very young new make spirit, 12 or so months old, no older than that, maybe 18 months old, and sent out to California where um, a Paul Davis and his Lost Spirits company uh, over there aged this rapidly. I think they use light, I believe, but they have some form of reactor, like some kind of bioreactor or something to rapidly age the spirit with modified wood. And specifically for this experiment, they used Riesling wood, much like the tonic wine. Robbie being a uh, Roddy, sorry, being a, a wine aficionado as well, will know that Riesling is not oak aged. There's no wood involved in Riesling, but they used that just to flavour, I guess, the wood. Um, and then they, they, I get, I don't know the process, but they somehow rapid aged this. Um, in order to accelerate uh, the aging process and make this whiskey taste like a mature Scotch whiskey, but aged much quicker and much more efficiently. Hence the name Abomination. This is chapter two uh, using, uh, this is the heavily peated malt and they call this the Sayers of the Law edition. There was also the crying of the Puma as well. Um, this used the heavily charred uh, rice lingwood. The crying of the Puma used, used only toasted so, what, 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 what? I, I know, I know, I know. We don't know where to start. The only thing that this doesn't say on the bottle is whiskey, but the spirit is new make Isla spirit, peated new make Isla spirit. So I don't know which is which because I poured them together and then I've been switching the glasses around, but I, I know which is which. Because what I'm going to compare it against, <laughs> just for kicks, is this beauty, <laughs> which is a genuine thing. This is Namibian whiskey. Namibia is very, very close to South Africa, borders South Africa and the southwest coast of the African continent, Namibia. Namibian whiskey. And you can see on the bottle there the silhouette of an elephant above uh, the word unjaba, I think, is how you pronounce that. I don't know for sure. But this is smoked whiskey as well. But much in the way the Icelandic whiskey was smoked using sheep dung, can we guess what kind of creature <laughs> had to shite on the ground in order to have it dried out and smoke the barley for this? Was, of course, <laughs> elephant. What we have here from Stefan Novak, you star... He uh, sent me out some of it, and it's been sitting in the sample bottle for a long time, waiting for the right moment, and I can think of no better moment than this. <laughs> um, in order for us to try this, I have not sipped this. The first time I'm smelling this is this evening. And I'm not getting it confused. I'm going to hold this up. There's going to be a wee red dot under this glass. <laughs> Indeed, there is. A, a white dot with a red wee tiny ink dot on it. I'll, you can all see it there. I'm, that's how I marked it. Because... There is, there is, Isla is still in this abomination, right, Roddy? Smell it. It's, well, you're mm -hmm. sick already. The sootiness, the peatiness, the smoke, everything is intact in that glass. This Namibian whiskey. The, I mean, per, I mean, perhaps it's because we're, we're tasting the Namibian next to the abomination, but it seems really elegant and refined to me. You know, it's a lot lighter. Um, I guess it's, I mean, w w was the spirit matured in Namibia? Yeah. Can I read that's, out a, that's wee, gonna... a, wee, a wee comment uh, left by uh, my my dear friend in Germany? Uh, this is from uh, Stefan Novak, specifically for Roddy. In the Spirit versus Cask V-Pub, Mr. Roddy Graham defined his three levels of sulfur funk the third and most horrible level for him was the German whiskey drinker level. <laughs> As a German whiskey drinker, I have only one thing to say to Mr. Graham. Revenge is best served with a little hint of elephant shite. <laughs> touché, touché. Touché, touché, Stefan Novak. <laughs> and I have to say, I just thought when I, as soon as I read that comment out, I thought that has to make it onto the stream. Thank you, Stefan, so much. But I, I by the way, I, in, in all defence of Roddy, I, I completely 
I understand exactly what the intention of his comment, and I know for a fact Roddy did not mean any offence whatsoever when he talks about that. That you know that idea of uh, I I would suggest that level of of sulphur is I call it Sevy the alchemist level. That's what he's chasing. He's at the extreme the, end of that spectrum. That's what I, he loves. I, I like a whiskey like that every now and again, you know. But it's it's the same thing as what you were saying about Long Row Red, you know, like a a big punchy Isla and a sulphur cask, you know. Or or um, something. That's why it needs a Mortlack or something like that out of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It needs that something that's got the weight to 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 compete with a cask that's going to. Um, by the way, not all all the sulphur that we're talking about. It's from a cask, right? You know, some of the sulfur is from the barley, the process. Lots of things can be harvested or dialed out during the make, whiskey making process. Sometimes, thanks to Jim Murray, potentially, uh, when we talk about sulfur, we, we think about sulfur candles and, and all of that thing that, that happened once upon a time. What we're talking about is natural sulfurs that, that can often occur. Um, but that's not actually here tonight. Don't Let's not get... On the nose, certainly, I haven't tried this. Have you tried both of these now? Um, I've just I've tasted the Namibian. I haven't tasted the Abomination. So you've got that's it in the that, first. Yeah, it's, that's lovely. It's the... That's a classy dram. It's a, it's a bit like the the Floki, though, the, the, the smoke is not you know, it's a different quality of smoke from a from a peat smoke. It's 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 quieter. Um, it's grassier. This is tobacco, and well, this this is the it's the same as the Loki. Uh, the, sorry, the Floki. The Loki. It's the same as the Floki in the sense that the 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 way it knows is is so different from the palate. It's it's unsmoked tobacco. It's like cigars. No, it's, it's, it's in the humidity. Or, or a, a, a pouch of Golden Virginia. I'm talking about moist tobacco. And a, I want to say like red licorice maybe. Licorice all sorts. No, it's like red licorice. There is, there is actually um, a <laughs> like, um, because because we know that this is smoked with elephant dung, I can't think of a good way to phrase this. But there is I'd forgotten about the elephant dung. Wow, that's <laughs> that's that's a really really good thing. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, if you were if you were tasting a whiskey from Campbelltown and you said, "Oh, that's a bit farmyardy," everybody would be like, "Oh yeah, mm, yeah, oh yeah." And this 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 is a bit farmyardy, but it's. Because I know how it's been smoked, but it's less good. Oh no, I, I'm I'm I've des I've definitely got some African plains going on here. I've got go. I've got wildebeest and giraffes and <laughs> that, <laughs> I, I have to say African plains. There, there, there's the uh, on the nose. I was I was kind of bracing myself for an odd experience. This is much more linear and clean and easily accessible than the nose suggested, than the idea, the concept of it suggested. Hmm. You said oh, classy. The tobacco thing. Would classy, yeah, 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 yeah. But that, that tobacco thing you said, Roy, is really, it's really coming through strongly now. But it's wet tobacco. It's like a, a mulchy, moist. This did you? You said you said licorice as well, didn't you? It's like a or aniseed I, balls or something like that. I was trying to place it, and I'm not sure, but it, it was definitely like a. I, I, I think first, before I went to licorice, I was kind of at lemon drops and all of that, and I knew I was the right. But I'm thinking it's you remember the kind of strawberry laces that we used to get, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But maybe maybe a wee bit aniseed. Mm, Red licorice mm -hmm. makes sense. This is this is Moorish. <laughs> it's a classy whiskey. Are you not surprised? Um Well, I've never tasted anything from Namibia before, and I've never tasted anything that's been smoked using elephant dung. 
it's I guess I had low expectations of it, and it's way it's it's really awfully good. There's some there is something in the mid palate that's kind of slightly drying and tannic, and kind of just at the roof of the mouth. There is something slightly jarring right in the middle, right in the development, I think. But it's not, it, it's it's almost like a wee note of just kind of telling you that it's there rather than being anything particularly off-putting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, uh, let's not get anybody, this is me speaking, and I don't mean to be speaking, I know that I, I'm not speaking for you. Let's not get anybody excited that this is like some kind of, that this isn't Scotch whiskey. But it's not so different that you couldn't sit down and be told that it's scotch and be quite happy sitting there thinking it's just some kind of odd take on scotch. I was, I was just thinking, Roy, I'd, I'd love to sneak this into a club tasting as a blind drum. Aye. I mean, I don't it would know be, if you still buy this. Yeah. I don't know. It would be a mean thing to do because it, it's, it is, as you say, close enough to the scotch mainstream that it it could it could slide on by, you know. Absolutely. I guess I get I guess my to be terribly commercial, I guess to know how much how impressed I am by this whiskey, I need to know the price. If that's do you know that at all? I didn't even check. Uh, I'll, well, uh, rather than me look it up and be rude like that, I, I guess the barflies can just chime in and let me know. Can we still buy on Jabba? Namibian whiskey, specifically the one that we're after, is this Stefan Novak's uh, Elephant Dung. <laughs> Elephant <laughs> Dung one, yeah. That's the one. Uh, Neil Cochran is saying, Roy, this is ridiculously wonderful descriptions. <laughs> and Hellswood is saying, lol, you said you couldn't polish a turd. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the great writer is saying Elephant Dung equals grassy. Uh, well, no, this isn't a grassy. No, it's, it's the... Sure. Mm, if you to oh, go but, back to the the floki, yeah, that is the floki really is grassy, but this is this is something different. So the oh. I see people are saying it's about fifty five euros. That's 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 excellent. That's, you know that's good value. Andrew this Pierce is, is asking, asking, do they keep their own elephants, or does someone go out searching for it just to make whiskey? I think it's the same as Pete Andrews. Pete is not, somebody didn't design Pete as a flavour seasoning thing in Scotch whiskey. It's fuel. It was it was an incidental thing that happened. And elephant dung, I guess, is perfectly valid fuel. And if you have elephants roaming around and leaving turds that will fill your fireplace, you dry them and you burn them, I guess, if they burn, right? It's, that, that's kind of where it's come from. And it, this, the, the, where, where you could get the suggestion of farmyard and things in the Floki, I still, and easily you get that vision of farmyard things. And this Namibian whiskey, this on Jabba or however you pronounce it, that's not happening. I, I was, I didn't think, even think about that. I'm, all, I'm starting to get quite a sort of juicy thing, you know, um, you know, quite a sweet, fruity juiciness to it. Like I say, there Which is I a guess. Odd there is an odd thing happening mid palate, kind of slightly. I don't want to say acrid because that's no. As if it's maybe just been slightly too long in the wood. Aye, something you know, like you know, that. It's just something, aye, something slightly is, gone past the point. But like a green wood thing. Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Gentlemen, Rosford is saying. They're saying, let's remember that un ungulates do not digest their food very well, so the grass and grains pass through, and what comes out is essentially peat. Thomas, well, I love the insight. <laughs> Fantastic. And Stefan Novak is saying, Rod Graham, yes, I can buy you a bottle. No problem. <laughs> there you go. We'll get one for the club, Stefan. Aye. Yeah. Well, I don't know how we'll get it here. We'll need to use the meal network, Stefan, after oh, post-Brexit, yeah. but we'll get it here. We'll get it here. Spawn Freak is saying, Dumbo has your taste buds flying. I have to be honest with you, Spawn Freak. It really does. Hey, ben Demon Hunter saying, Roy Blind Challenge. Ed, Rock Gut Review with Unjaba. Ed would love this. He would absolutely lap it up. And repairs, I, I got that one. Whiskey Games, Matt Bishop is saying, according to Google, elephants eat roots, grasses, fruit, and bark. Does this help? 
Hmm? Well, certainly it, what it means is that I am not, neither Roddy or I are drinking shite. We are drinking something that is absolutely interesting, intriguing, palatable, and we're not even being polite to something that should be odd. This is genuinely quite a nice drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you, you said, you, you, I think you maybe said safe, Roy, and it, 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 or, or mainstream or something like that. You know, it's really not that far from... I said clean, Many other Scots. clear, simple, clean. Mm -hmm. right down mm -hmm. the middle. That kind of, kind of that is. You know, it's it, it's a good it's a good whiskey, um, and the the price point seems about right to me. You know, go Namibia. Yeah, really, absolutely. So I have to say, California and Scotland, this whatever abomination of a collaboration that's made <laughs> the abomination. It's got a lot to do, and I've tasted this before. Oh, that's a good one to finish on. It's a bit ferocious. Now, well, the ABV is high, Rod Roddy. This is 54% ABV, so they're being generous with it. Um, and I've got a wee drop of water here if, if I need to. I don't find it too ferocious. I actually find that my problem with this is when you look at this, when you, okay, when you nose this, there's every, that kind of Isla thing there. The sootiness on the smoke is there. Mm-hmm. The only thing I, I I understand from reading about this is that it is understood to be not Kalila, which is odd to me because it knows is a lot like Kalila. But, but I then it's been not. You know, I don't know that you could, given that weird maturation process. Yeah, you don't know what. I still, that's, I, you still, I still get trying to get over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so but the way it goes is, and the way you look at it in the glass, you're expecting a sherry dialer, right? Mm -hmm. Because the colour is exactly like a nicely, heavily sherried isla. And then you drink it. There is no, to me, nothing that would line up with a sherry cask maturation here. And there isn't. But that's jarring immediately. The other thing that comes across is that I think somebody would need to tell you that you're drinking young Isla Spirit to be able to spot that it's young Isla Spirit. Would you agree or disagree? Um, partially. I mean, it, it, for me, it's jaggy. You know, it, 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 you're finding youth still. So, yeah, it's got that. You know that you know with with yep. whiskey that's that's been that's been bottled too soon. It's it's like it's it's jag, you know it's jaggy on your. Oh, tongue, I get right? that completely, and it is literally it's yeah. the best way to describe it, jaggy. But the especially you know, the, in contrast with that that kind of almost gloopy smooth Namibian whiskey, right? <laughs> um, you've got this 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 much more kind of. Uh, gritty, jaggy, vibrant. But yeah, there's no way that I would have I would home in on on Isla. You know, it seems this, that sootiness is more like what I would associate with Highland peated whiskies. You know, I'm not I'm not getting any of the sort of salty character that I usually find in Kalila. No, there's, that's. I would say that that's true. There's no kind of. No, there isn't a kind of medicinal note from it. You know, what you would get in the Southern Islands. You know, there's no kind of a, mm -hmm. a edini. Now that I'm warming up to it, because it's it is the the contrast between the Namibian and this. Once you get past the jagginess, I'm enjoying the flavours in it. You know, it's it goes it, a wee bit. Uh, to me, it's a wee bit like cherry cola. Cherry, yeah, it is cherry, isn't it? Mm. But there, there is a, there is an odd kind of. Um, I, I often get a kind of ice and sugar sweetness from Isla whiskies. Kalila, Lagavulin, mm. like a like a, a sugar sweetness that's that's here. Um, I would, 
I don't know how you feel the same as me, but this doesn't feel like a fully peated 40, 50 plus PPM. It, it's kind of middle of the road. Um, but again, because mm -hmm. of the maturation, it, it could mask that, I think. I I still can't get, get my head around that maturation. I mean, the so, you know, where did the Riesling come from? The... You know, the, yep. the, 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 was it? Uh, I just, I, I just can't parse that at all. Well, I think what uh, they've done, I mean, if if I understand this right, and please somebody jump in and and straighten me out in the lounge here tonight if I've got this wrong. But I think what they did is they took wine, uh, genuine wine, um, casks or wine staves, and and um, stripped them basically. Uh, stripped the previous uh, incumbent from the from the staves, and then they soaked them again in riesling. That's where the riesling comes in, and then they re remove them again, and either toast them after or toast them perhaps before. The, in fact, they toast them before they go into the riesling. I think. So they toast them, put them back in with the riesling, and at this point they're not full staves; they're small pieces of wood, they're perhaps splinters or chips or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. Then they go into this reactor where I think they use light. I can't even visualize what this thing looks like. You'd think that if I was going to uh, have a, a broadcast on it, that I would have spent a bit of time re researching it. But there's eight, eight whiskeys in front of us, right? So, um, and they, they rapidly age this thing. They must do something clever because they're not using, uh, they're not using any artificial color. So this color has come out of the process. Mm -hmm. See the, the the thing is that I I can't get my head around why they would have decided to because because riesling does get matured in in wood, but the the traditional way because it doesn't take to wood is that you use large barrels or vats and you use them for a very long time so that they build up a layer of tartrates. So, so it's, you're not looking for any interaction with the wood, it's simply yeah, a vessel, it's, right? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. So the, it's this kind of weird, like they've, they've, they've decided we're going to use wine barrels and then you randomly pick the worst possible kind of wine to, <laughs> to, to, to pair with a barrel, you know? Uh, and, and I can't even see, you know, why would you take barrels that are all gunked up with tartrates because that's I, I just i just can't get my get my head around it Roy. you know well I, I don't i don't know what what bar they they didn't take riesling wood they took some other kind of oak aged wine whatever it might have been um and, and then stripped that so the the wood that the, and this is based on some very brief reading that i did earlier in the week in the run up to this when i was sending out the samples and things um so I, I don't think they've not taken any kind of rice wood. What they've done is they've taken some genuine wine staves and then stripped them, toasted them, and then re-soaked them um, in smaller, smaller pieces before going into this reactor. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, Sorry, go ahead, Roddy. No, just maybe, maybe um, if they've done it with a sweet wine, that's where the colour's coming from. They're getting some kind of... You know, and then, you know, you're getting some... I mean, it doesn't taste that sweet, but maybe you were getting some sort of caramelisation that was giving it colour. Maybe from, from the Riesling, you think? Sweet Riesling? Or? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, whiskey, I'm, absolutely... I'm, I'm looking... I'm going to jump into the chat to see if they've got any intel on it, but uh, Greg is talking about the Namibian. On Jabba the Hutt was the first name <laughs> of this whiskey, but they were afraid of some Disney. On Jabba the Hutt... <laughs> Uh, Greg's Whiskey, I heard something like that. Yeah, Roy. Um, Greg's Whiskey, he's in quotes from their website. The technology works by exposing oak to high intensity light and heat while suspended in a glass tube filled with unaged or young distilled spirit. The combination of specific wavelengths of light and heat has been proven to trigger the same chemical reactions that happen in casks aged for many years. Well, I accept the science behind that, Greg. I'll accept it because I don't know enough to, to do anything else. But what I'll also say is that what, it, what it, you can never replace is, the, is time. You can never cheat time. 
So environment, the 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 where you are, how the damp dunnage or the damp uh, climate in Scotland, whatever it may be, in Ireland, wherever it is you're doing that, where you're just letting time and the environment and the air and everything have a bit of a voice as well. That's that's not going to be... Having said all of that, I, I'm going to just say straight out, and I know that it might not be your opinion, but this is bra to me. But bra not in the sense that when the bottle drains, I need to have another one. Bra as in, I. You've made whiskey, and it just full stop. Do you know what I mean? That's that's it. That's you know. I know the first chapter that they released was their own mash, their own spirit. The second chapter they brought in some Isla spirit, but I think what they've achieved here is a remarkable story and whiskey, and not much else. Um, for me, Roy, it's it's the same as the Floki. It's it's good in itself, but in terms of a whiskey tasting, that's a no. So it's a can I split my vote like that? You know, both a an I a bra and a no. You know, you're probably glad to have tried it, right? It's a, an interesting thing. And in fact, after Aye, what I've just said, by the way, you've made whiskey well done. They haven't made whiskey. This is not whiskey. <laughs> just to be clear, um, and it doesn't say whiskey anywhere on the bottle. And it, this cannot legally be called whiskey. Certainly, uh, can it be called Scotch whiskey? So, um, so there were there were three no's for you tonight, and two no's for me. Uh, two no's for no uh, one. I think only one no. I said, yeah, only the tonic wine one. I said no to. Um, that was you, we agreed on the tonic wine, and I was I, I gave a qualified no on the Floki. Aye, you, you still enjoyed it as a drink, but maybe aye, not aye. a whiskey lineup. I absolutely, and I get that completely. And I also get what you're talking about with the abomination as well, despite it being produced as, well, you make spirit, but produced on Isla as intended to be whiskey originally. I think we've kept our buddy in the background waiting far too long for a wee game, uh, a wee quiz. We're not going to be playing as at Space Side tonight. We don't have the time for that. Thank you all so much for your patience tonight. Thanks for hanging out with us. In summary, Roddy, though, before we bring Menno in, did we, did we, I think, okay, I'll summarise first because I think it's fairly straightforward. I think we did go out there and touch on some pretty bizarre and oddball whiskies. There are some here that I'll be very glad to keep in the collection. I'm thinking about the Balcones. Um, I think I would be quite happy to have some of the Floki around. Um, I would honestly be happy to have some of that uh, Abasolo Mexican corn whiskey around. Um, the rest of them, I think the standout is probably the, the Namibian because it's so striking when you expect it to be so appalling. It is mm. actually so striking and quite nice and easy to enjoy and, and interesting. The mm. takeaway is that this is good fun and a nice distraction, but I was suspicious that all it would do would make me happy that we have well-known defined categories like bourbon and rye and Canadian and Japanese and Irish and Scotch, that we just kind of know the shape of the animal. We know where its jaggy bits are, where its nice warm fuzzy bits are, where all the interesting bits are, and we just know. And it's great that you can go out and see the, all these new, interesting, bizarre and rare and harder to find flora and fauna, but it's nice if your back garden just has a sheep in it or a coo or an elephant or whatever it may be, there's something reassuring to know what to expect, if that makes any sense. My takeaway from tonight is if you get the opportunity to try these things, try them, you might find something remarkable, like honestly we did tonight with this Namibian. But you might find yourself thinking, the whiskies that we know are made the way that they are for a reason. <laughs> Well, how would you summarise? Um, I enjoyed that so much, Roy. It was it was fascinating, you know. And the Namibian, what a discovery, you know. Like I, I honestly want to try and sneak a bottle of that into a club lineup. Uh, Brilliant. Probably like Neil's been in on the chat tonight, so Neil has had the heads up. So it'll need to be like a year down the line or something. Uh, 
but I genuinely want to sneak that into a club lineup and see what people think of it blind, you know. I, I don't um, think you need to worry about when you sneak it in, Roddy. It's only you and I that's tasted it. I think this would be so under the raid. In fact, the more club members that watch tonight, the better, because every single dram they pull up to their face, they're going to be suspicious <laughs> for every blind dram from here on in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Indeed. that Namibian thing, isn't it? This is elephant yeah, shit yeah. you've given us here. <laughs> it would be excellent. But the, what, what I was going to finish by saying, Roy, was that you know, I've really enjoyed them and, uh, you know, even the uh, the rhythm and booze that, that I thought didn't work, you know, it was, it, it's it's that thing that we all do of like, okay, you can tick it off your list, you know, but yeah. I'm going back to the remnant, this is my warm-up tram, it's not even an Iglian Cairn glass, this is what I had to, to warm up my palate at the start of the evening and it's the, it's the remnants of a Springbank 10-year-old, you know. Right, brilliant. Yeah, uh, and I'm that's what I'm going back to, and I'm like, you know, this is this is home. You know, this is home. Well, that's uh, interesting and because it's, here's it's, here's what I here's the dirty glass I left from my <laughs> starter tonight was that Glen Burgie. I'm just going to pour a tiny amount now. I'm not driving or doing anything tomorrow, so I've been uh, well. I've been very very careful. I know that I can be quite safe, and a wee bit of the, look. I've got a wee bit of the lilac wax has dropped into that dram from the cork. Mm -hmm. From the seal, so I'll need, it's, Glenn Burgie's going to be extra specially waxy tonight. Aye. So you know, I, I do love to to taste these these weird things, and when you discover something that's genuinely, you know, genuinely good, like the Namibian one, um, but it just reminds me how good Scotch really is. Sometimes simple can be spectacularly complicated to achieve right yeah and mm -hmm. to complicate things can be very very simple <laughs> and there's I'm, I'm i know there's a cleaner way to, to to say that to quote that but anyway roddy are you able to hang out with us a wee bit longer or are you working tomorrow can you stay for the quiz yeah hey, well i'm working from home so i can fall out my bed and sit down and start typing you know you and i have a similarly distanced commute tomorrow morning Let's go right. for that. Let's get a friend who's an hour ahead of us as well, sitting in the background. I'll need to wake him up now, ring, send some alarms, give him a wee phone. Menno, I'm so, so grateful for your patience, buddy. Um, I hope, I have an inkling, and you've reassured me that you enjoy doing this. Absolutely, yeah. Even although it means you staying up till uh, it's now after 1 a.m. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm uh, off work tomorrow as well. The kids are... Uh, don't have to go to school, so I can, if they'll allow me, uh, squeeze some sleep in uh, for tomorrow. So I'll be Extra fine. Extra time, yeah. Even if it's on the sofa, the same as me, right? <laughs> Listen, um, I, I did reach out to you in advance, and we did make sure that the date was going to be okay for tomorrow and things like that. So without any hesitation, Roddy has, has been uh, well prepared and for what he's just about to be. I always feel like I've been in a bit of a boxing ring after a menu quiz. Ah. He's, he, he survived one already, so he'll do fine again, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you. And and uh, thank you very much for that, Filiers. Uh, um, Jennifer, that I'm still very much enjoying as well, that I shared with sure. Roddy the first time he was on. Fantastic. I am ready to relax now, as if I wasn't relaxed enough, and uh, just sit back. And uh, what I need is a wee piece of paper with A, B, and C on it so we can hold it up, Roddy. Can you do that? Do you have a piece of paper? Hey. I will hand over hosting to my friend Menno. Can we drag this window? In an office? Yes, we can drag and put Menno up the top. Fantastic. Okay, whenever you're ready. I am ready. Go right ahead, Menno. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks to everybody for, for being so patient tonight as well. Awesome. Sorry. Awesome VPUB topic, says Andrew Pierce. Uh, and he's mentioning Menno as well. Quiz after being awake since 5.30 a.m., maybe a challenge now. Three is my pass mark tonight. Andrew, I agree with you for a Menno quiz. Maybe we, should lower, we should lower the barrier. Okay. Fantastic. And Jimmy Legg bought me a dram as well. That was so much fun. He said some really hilarious comments from the V-pubbers, some brilliant folks here. Absolutely, I love you all so much. And actually saying past 1 a.m. I'll have to turn and have a good quiz. Please come back and see what Menno has in store for us.
Fantastic. Men, I'll take it away, my friend. Okay, Please we be start. Please yes, be yeah. a, a wee bit gentle. We start with a sort of on topic question. Which distillery releases a whiskey called Bastards, made from a mash bill of malted rye and malted barley, matured in American virgin oak and finished in mezcal casks? Mm -hmm. Is that A, Sierra Norte in Mexico, B, Stoning in Denmark, or C, Shelter Point in Canada? I think I know this. I feel fairly comfortable about it. Feel pretty. In fact, I think I've mentioned it in a VPUB before. Let's see how we go on. I'm ready. Give us a countdown, Menno. All right. In three, two, one. Let's have it. B and C. Oh, Roddy and I have split I've got it here. Oh, it's, it's stunning. stunning. Oh. Well done, Roddy. Okay. Question two. Who's clanking about all the glassware and? Oh, that's that's me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Question two. Quite unexpectedly, Kirsty McCallum left Glen Murray for the company behind brands like Krabby, Peaky Blinders, and the Pokes Irish Whiskey. Whiskey. What's the name of this company? Is that A, the ultimate whiskey company, B, Halewood Artisanal Spirits, or C, Cannon Mills Whiskey Company? A chance Roddy for redemption, I think, Roy? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Give, give us a countdown when you're ready. Yes. Man. Three, two, one. Answers, please. B and a B, and you're both absolutely Correct. A B and a B. Question three, a first possible banana skin. Glenn Fiddich and William Grant can in one way or another be linked to a number of other distilleries. Which of these is not one of them? Is that A, Cardu, B, Mortlach, Mortlach or C, Glenn Farkless? So which of these three One distilleries way, have it. no ties or no links to William Grant or Glenn Fiddich? Wow. Okay. Wow, this is a banana skin. This is a banana skin. This is a pure guess. I don't know how if you're feeling confident, Roddy. Um, I'm making a 50-50 guess. Okay, good. I I know one of the connections. Okay. When, when you're ready, Mero. Okay, answers in three, two, one, please, gentlemen. A C and a C. <laughs> well, uh, I can tell you, and you probably know, that William Grant started his career at Mortlach yeah. before uh, building Glenfiddich. And he also started with second-hand equipment from Cardu, so Glenn Farkless is indeed the one where there's no connection with, despite being the Grant family as well, there's no uh, family connection with the Grant from uh, Glenn I had of a notion about Mortlach. Yeah. I had no idea about Cardu, and I was guessing on C. I scraped mm -hmm. through that one. Man, oh, super. Well done. Question. Well done. Question. question four. Recent episodes of the Liquid Antiquarian caused a bit of a stir because they revealed what? A. Scotch distilleries were actively involved in smuggling during Prohibition. B. A, substanti uh, sorry, a substantial part of what was produced at early 19th century malt distilleries was in fact not malt whiskey. Or C. A number of royal warrants granted to distilleries and brands were acquired through bribery. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I, I didn't hear about this. Is this because I took an, an Easter break? I'm going to have to ah, You need to catch again. up. You need to catch up. On... <laughs> I'm going to have to. 
I'm going to have to catch up on the liquid antiquarian and controversy. Oh my goodness, I'm going to need to guess here. I'm going to need to guess. Okay, answers, please. Okay, ready. Shoot. In three, two, one, B and a B. Absolutely. Brody, you know that? No, that's a good I've scraped through. <laughs> I've been scraped Well done. Out. Is that true? Did they get some blowback yeah. then on it? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I think Arthur can probably explain better than, uh, than myself. But uh, a lot of uh, what was being produced was not malt, but came from uh, mixed wash. Um, yeah. So using corn and wheat and oats, and or probably not corn uh, back then, but wheat and oats and unmalted barley. Uh, so uh, that caused a bit of a stir, apparently, because the whole idea or concept of what we assume as being the birth of malt uh, whiskey is in fact, or probably not, actually the birth of malt whiskey. Okay. Question okay. five is always a picture question. And obviously we're looking at a Scottish whiskey aisle or an aisle where whiskey like is a, being a, produced. A stuffed teddy that slumped over. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a close-up from Scotland focusing on one of the aisles. But the question is, of course, which aisle are we looking at? Are we looking at a sky... B, Mull, or C, Isla? Excellent question. Only excellent because I know it. <laughs> <laughs> when you're ready. Okay, answers in three, two, one. A B for Mull and another B for Mull. And another point for the both of you. It was indeed Mull. Fantastic. You're doing pretty well. <laughs> the, I think I have a pass mark. Five well out of done. five for Roddy Graham. <laughs> Charging through. I, I, can I can switch off now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the wax out of my Glenburgie. <laughs> Question okay. six. Why isn't it a good idea to drink whiskey on an airplane? Is it A, because it kickstarts the angel chair, evaporating alcohol? B, because it increases the impact of alcohol, getting you drunk quicker? Or C, it diminishes our ability to taste sweet, sour, salt, and bitter notes? Oh. I mean, arguably, B would be a good thing rather than a bad thing. <laughs> uh huh. Um Right until you start to harass the stewardess, that's <laughs> probably yeah, yeah. um, forced diversion to drop off a roddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to guess here, Menno. I hope it's an educated guess. <laughs> okay, then please, in three, two, one, answers, please. A C oh. and a. Sorry. <laughs> A C and a C, and indeed, again, you are correct. Damn it, this quiz is too easy. It that's has nothing not, to do honestly, with Delta Two. That it's, it's pure. That's pure, pure guesswork. <laughs> I have no clue what's there at all. So it's because of it's yeah. the altitude. Is it the pressure? No, it, it no, doesn't have are. anything to do with the altitude. It's because of the change in air pressure and humidity. I, so I knew that. That. Sorry, Mary, when you go. No, no. Just go ahead. I just. Just I knew that that was the case with wine because the mm -hmm. the, the the job of picking wine lists for first mm -hmm. class cabins and airplanes is a very specialised job because you can't use your normal sort wow. of rules for wine lists. But I didn't realise it affected spirits as well. So that, well, that was a guess. Consider the the whiskey selection you're going to get on your well your average flight. I've never been in first class <laughs> anywhere. But, um, <laughs> Uh, they just all a whiskey, right? Johnny Walker Red or something like that. Yeah. Cures or a whatever it may be. Yeah. Occasionally you might get a Glenfinnick or something. Excellent. Cool okay. question. Another cool question. Then on to question seven. And as the weather has been a bit horrid as of lately, 
One could do with a hot toddy. There are various explanations for the origins of the name hot toddy. Which of these is not one of them? It comes from the Gaelic tog or togale, which means to brew or to distill. B, it was invented by a Dr. Todd. Or C, it comes from the toddy drink in India, which is made from fermented sap of palm trees. Oh. So which of these has nothing to do with the origin of the word hot toddy? Oh my goodness me. I'm guessing, absolutely guessing. So let's go for it again. Okay, three, two, one. Answers, please. An A and a C. Oh, I was 50 50 between those two as well. I, I have to say that there is indeed a Dr. Todd who invented um, the hot toddy or claims to have invented the hot toddy, but other sources say that indeed it comes from the toddy drink in India. So Rod is on a roll. Answer A was correct. Oh, it, it comes from the... It India. could come from either Dr. Todd or it could come ah, from okay. the hot toddy, the, the, the Indian drink uh, from the palm trees. So Roddy kills wow. he's killing it tonight. You're in a full house, Roddy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> On a metal quiz as well. Ah, the Jimmy. best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. <laughs> Jimmy Leggett screaming he's on a three out of seven. Don't worry, Jimmy, you've still got a chance to catch up. Ryan Sutherland is on seven out of seven as well. Dogs have no uncles. That's Colin. I think he's Colin on seven out of seven, as well as Andrew Pierce. Mark, I think I saw Stefan Novak on seven out of seven as well. Was that a six Brilliant. out of six? I saw him on. Ross Fudd on seven out of seven. Andrew Butler on seven out of seven. Neno. You've been gentle with everyone except for Aye. me tonight. <laughs> Actually, I'm doing okay. I'm quite happy. I'm only two down with three left to go. Okay. So here it comes. In the 19th century, the term Glenlivet was often used by distilleries to emphasize the quality of their whiskey, which distillery aimed for suspension of disbelief, calling itself Glenforest Glenlivet, even though it's some 90 miles away from the actual Glenlivet. Was that A, Edradar, B, Federcairn, or C, Balblair? The oh. clue might be in... You did research on this for the Glasgow Whiskey Club, Roddy <laughs> Graham. I, I, I did. I, I can't remember, though, because there's, there's, there's three dozen of the buggers. Uh -huh. uh. There's a vague spectre in my head telling me... Oh, jings. <laughs> right. So this is a guess. Okay. I'm, I'm guessing, but there is a spectre in my head that suggests it could be right. When you're ready, buddy. All right. In three, two, one, answers, please. It's a B for Federkern and an A. Well, I can tell you, Roy is gaining on you now. It was Edredar. Glen Forest, Glen Levitt. Wow. Absolutely. It's disappointing. No hate messages coming in through the chats so far. <laughs> Need to step up my game. No, I think they're all looking they're always looking forward. Ryan Sullivan's on an eight out of eight. Whoop whoop he's saying. Here's my god and saying that's a new one. And Falsegraf is saying, dang, stuck at the pass mark now. Oh, you were doing well, Falsegraf. And they suddenly ran into some trouble. Five out of eight for Ben Demon Hunter, and he is so happy. But Jimmy Leg is stuck on three and Aye. screaming elephant shite. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I always trust our, our, our Jimmy to, to bring the, the frustration and comments. Right? <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, second to last question. The Johnny Walker Fort Cornish project will have four visitor centers in four different distilleries. Kalila, Cardu, Kleinlich, and where is the last one? Is it A, at Blair Atoll, B, at Royal Lochnagar, or C, at Glen Kinshi? I think this might be the the only one that's actually finished. Hmm. 
Hmm. Next whiskey guide is not happy with you either. He's uh, he's suggesting that you're a, the Belgian and another following up with another B word that's not as pleasant as Belgian. <laughs> Could it have something to do with uh, Danish whiskey? <laughs> well, it's definitely got everything to do with Greg's score tonight, probably. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm ready when you guys are. Okay, answers in three, two, one. Let's see, Glen Kinchy. Well, I can tell you that Blair Rattle is probably Biagio's uh, best visited distillery, but that's not it. And there is a sort of education center at Royal Lochnagar for employees of the HO. So that's not it either. So it was indeed Clint Kinchy. Well done, both of you. I heard they disbanded that, that program at, at, the, the, at Royal Lochnagar. I think they'd, they'd get rid of it. Um, yeah, could have been. But there was a sort of, well, what, what they call it, advocate program or something like that. Advocacy, that's right. Yeah. Let's see what. Let's see if there's anybody on a, on decent scores before the last question of the night. I have seen photos of Glen Kinchy, so it better be C. Says Sheila at Whiskey Central. I want to see C, but it's a banana skin. C, you dirty dog. You went with it and you got it right. Well done, Neil Cochran. C, an easy question from men, or surely not? Well, it's only easy if you know it, right, Graham? Um, and that's Graham Fraser. Can I just a shout out to Graham Fraser? He's amazing in the Barflies Facebook page, isn't he? The amount of content Absolutely. that he provides, the photos, the insight to the distilleries and stuff. Graham, it's a, a privilege to have you as part of the community, my friend. Wonderful stuff. Some folk celebrating that they've passed already. Jimmy Jazz on a five out of nine celebrating. And the, the banana skin threw Lindsay off there. So he's only on six out of nine. He chose something else. Um, fantastic. Great stuff. Uh, Ryan Sullivan's in nine out of nine, but he's on the jitters. Oh, could it be? Comes, here comes the ask that question. So many of you this very, very friendly, I have to say, lounge tonight. That would be nice about the quiz. What are you going to do to us for the final question? Well, only one way to find out. The Excise Act of 1823 made it easier for distilleries to become legitimate. And within five years after the act passed, 203 <laughs> new distilleries were entered into the roles. So obviously most of them would have been uh, illicit uh, distilleries turning legitimate, and how many of those are still active today? Okay, that qualifies as a, an ASAC question. <laughs> I can I say so, yeah. a very, very good ASAC question. A very good ASAC question. Uh, you haven't is, seen. Something... You haven't seen the. You haven't seen the answers yet. <laughs> okay, but it's something I genuinely want to know. But okay. Roddy, the thing is, is that you're expecting three options or three numbers, but this is the ASAC. Roll it out, Menno. Tell us what is the okay, one is, it, is it A, about half as much as the total amount of Scotch distilleries active today? B, as much as there are Glen distilleries in Speyside? Or C, <laughs> as much as there are distilleries owned by the big four? Oh, my God. <laughs> Which is all about 65, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, if, if Arthur's still on the chat, I expect he's got the answer down to the, the, the nearest decimal point. <laughs> Which Arthur? Uh, the liquid antiquarian. Arthur Motley, was he in tonight? Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. He's doing well on the quiz too. I think he's on six or seven. Let me try and find him. Meno, that is truly an asshat question. It's brilliant. Take, it's brilliant. I do take <laughs> I do take pride in my asset questions. <laughs> right, right. Ryan Sutherland saying piss off. Whiskey Central saying no oh, for F's sake. So <laughs> ass hat emojis all over the place. Absolutely superb. I'm going to just guess the same as most people are. A wee bit of, I've not even had time to process for it to be educated guess. But let's go with. Ah, there could be an educated guess. So. Okay, I'm going to go with this. Okay, answers in three, two, one, please. We've got an A and an A. Same, we both well, think. 203 distilleries popping up um, after the Exercise Act passed. 200 years on, about half as the total amount of Scotch distilleries, it would be something like 66 or so. Um, that's not it, I'm sorry to say. Oh! Um, no. 
there are less than 10% of those distilleries still active today. So it's answer B, as much as there are Glen distilleries in Speyside, 14. Brittle. That's an incredible thing. Isn't it? Indeed. The, um, and I bet you it's the it's all the really good ones that have still survived. <laughs> it'll be that you know no, do you know what I mean? It'll be like all the all the crappy ones will have, have long gone. <laughs> you know? And it's just Oh, we got a ten out of ten from Andrew Pierce. Well done, congratulations. Rod Graham <laughs> is is in saying few, eight out of ten. <laughs> Well, that's good, that's good enough to beat me, buddy. That's definitely good enough to beat me. What did you guess on the last one? Obviously, you got the last one wrong there, because you were. Yeah, I went for. A. Yeah, I went for A. Went for A, yeah. Both of us did. That's yeah. right. Uh, seven out of ten for me. Absolutely brilliant, Menno. Superb questions. I think that there were a few of them that you were gentler with us, which is to be welcomed. Honestly, <laughs> else else <laughs> would ten out of ten happy with that. Um, fantastic. Uh, I have my own health and safety to consider as well. <laughs> you were starting to get threats, were you? Ah, <laughs> oh, superb. I'm looking for any 10 out of 10s tonight. So uh, I think Andrew you? Pierce managed a 10 out of 10, so. Dogs of No Uncles managed an 8, Chris Pollock a 9, superb Chris. Uh, Malt Minion, that's Chuck managed a 7, James McGoran on an 8, Bruno Martins. Uh, on a nine, superb Bruno, great score. Eight out of ten for Darbretter, whiskey hype, James McGoran. I got him. Stefan Novak managed an eight in the end. Sugar Kitty, eight. Molasses, eight. I'm looking for anybody. Greg's Whiskey Guide, oh no, seven out of ten. Greg, that's a brilliant score. I'm saying it's brilliant because that's what I scored. The Liquid Antiquarian is in tonight. And he's saying, yes. <laughs> Did he get a full house? <laughs> See, as he taps off, running around doing laps of his living room. <laughs> um, Superb. 10 out of 10 for Andrew Pears. It's a Menno quiz miracle. Andrew Pears, let's raise a wee glass to Andrew and anybody else that managed a 10 out of 10 on that pretty tough score. And they, no, the liquid antiquarian actually got 8 out of 10, but he's celebrating nonetheless. Andrew Pears, 10 out of 10 on that was an absolute belter of a score. Well done. Well done, Menno. Thank you so much, my friend. Cheers to everybody. What a great quiz. <laughs> really sheep dung. That is seven out of ten. The best score I've ever had on a Menno quiz. I think it equals my best on a Menno quiz. I've never beaten a seven on it for sure. Wonderful stuff. I'm going to miss a lot of con comments streaming in as well. Look at the time. We're almost uh, closing in on three hours. I kind of had a slight suspicion that it might be like that tonight. But I will be putting chapter markers uh, in the uh, description box below for anybody that's watching on the replay. And I appreciate everybody that's hung out with us until this time. Can I raise a glass to you two guys? I like encourage you, but I will not demand that you stay beyond the credits in order for me to thank you uh, offline. Um, but let me just say thank you both so much for staying with me to this especially for you, Menno, this time of night as well when it's an, you're an hour ahead, buddy. I love having you around, Menno. You're pleasure. a brilliant guy to have around. The fact that you're willing to step up and do something that could potentially encourage threats from our wonderful <laughs> community <laughs> as well is, is marvellous to me, buddy. I'm looking forward to you and yeah, I, I. I love that ass hat question, Menno. It's just brilliant, Oops. absolutely brilliant. Perfect, absolutely perfect. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up nicely. I'm going to take this watch. By the way, that does not understand a Scots accent normally. <laughs> Just learn not to wear it during the live stream. That's quite incredible. Jim Legs bought me a draft to see Roy, <laughs> Roddy, Menno, and Roy a winning combination. I have to agree with that. <laughs> with you guys and your support here as well especially character <laughs> you Jimmy Leg. it's an absolute pleasure to be here hanging out um, with these amazing <laughs> folk. Menno thank you so much for being here Multi-Mission, please pick up Menno's blog Menno's Multi-Mission blog, it's a great read I can't believe that English is your second language Menno, it's so easy to read thank you so much for being sure. part of the community and everything you do my friend, thank you and I'll see you very very soon, please hang around Roddy Graham, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. I don't care if it's virtually, if it's over Zoom on a Glasgow Whiskey Club night or in the Bon or wherever it might be at the Good Spirits Company. It's brilliant to have you willing to step up here, my friend. And thank you for wearing the uniform tonight as well. That was not uh, suggested, planned, or uh, it was a gift. And it was 
Aye, oh. but I quite liked having matching t-shirts tonight as well. <laughs> Vpub logo, superb. Buddy, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, thanks for staying up late. And uh, I know I'll get plagued until you come on again in the future. Uh, <laughs> I understand why. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you again. In the meantime, I'll enjoy the virtual Roddy. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. All the best. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful fun. Thank you all so, so much uh, for <laughs> sticking with me for another three hours. Um, and I hope you had a bit of fun with these oddball whiskies tonight. I think uh, there was a few surprises in there, some pleasant surprises, uh, some oddball things for sure. Um, but like we said, the takeaway is, is that uh, it's wonderful to go off and explore all of these amazing things. But I think one of the biggest things it can do is just kind of reassure us whatever it is that we're enjoying in day to day is is we're enjoying it for a reason um it's very very good at what it does i'm looking forward to hanging out with you all again a week from tonight where i'll be looking into uh gateway whiskies and the whiskies that actually brought us into this whole sphere in the first place and um, whether that was blends whether that was um something plain and ordinary or something big bold and rare whatever it was um, bring along your stories and I'll try to share as much as I can. I'm going to reach out to some fellow uh, YouTubers to join me next week and bring their stories as well live with me. I'm hoping that you'll uh, join me again next week. Benny has just bought me a dram as well from Denmark. He's saying, great to have you back, Roy, and great fun tonight. Very different, but probably the most fun VPUB for me until this date. <laughs> Thanks to Roddy and Menno as well. Slanch everybody. I have to say I missed it when I wasn't here last week, eh, but I was glad of the break, honestly, and I'm glad that you had a lot of fun here tonight, Benny. I'll raise this wee glass of Stefan's brimstone and say thank you very much for your dram. And thanks to everybody, Whiskey Central is saying so excited for next week. Sheila, I'm glad that you'll be joining us. Uh, Chris is saying, Slancha, all have a great Friday and weekend. Menno is saying, thank you, Roddy and Roy, for this. Just what the doctor ordered. I think that that's a good way to summarise it for me as well, Menno. Thanks to everyone, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. I know it was a long session tonight. It's very much appreciated that you've stuck with me for so long. You're all very dearly loved, and I'll see you next Thursday night. Slancha. <laughs>